Hello, everybody. This is the Stronghold Podcast, episode 14. We're back here with Alvin. Hey, guys. Uh, first podcast of 2020. So, hey, I'm excited to be here. First podcast of 2020, dude. It's a new year, and uh, you've got a lot of shit to talk. I, a lot. I, I know that already. You know, I think we made a mistake when we did the first podcast because we saved all the juicy shit for the second half of the podcast. Okay. You know, like um, when I look at all of the analytics for the video, <laughs> when I first posted the video up, it was like the first half of the video we talked about just whatever shit we were talking about, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about uh, SGBGJ Open and then just some random the UFC shit. And and we, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. we started talking about all of this UFC gym drama in the second half. Mm-hmm. And you could literally see in the annotations, like once the second half of the video started, that's when everybody Boom. started listening. Oh, shit. That's cool. Yeah, everybody fast forwarded. They didn't want to hear any of that bullshit in the wow, beginning. Wow, nice. Yeah, let's talk about the juicy stuff right in the beginning this yeah. time, right? So I think we just get into the, the good stuff at the very beginning because... You know, I just saw that, uh, I was just saying to you that McDojo Life now started sharing yeah, man. your issues with the UFC gym, and now it's going like viral again, and yeah. you started a GoFundMe page uh, to try to help you get, because basically, basically what's happening is the UFC gym is basically filing a, like a slap lawsuit against you. Like a libel? Is, is that how you pronounce it? Libel? Yeah, but, but it's a slap lawsuit, yeah. right? A slap yeah. lawsuit, for anybody that doesn't know, is a lawsuit where they basically just sue you for more money than you can afford to pay in the hopes of basically bullying you, intimidating you, making you deplete your resources to the point where you can't fight it anymore and then you just... I think that's what... I Allegedly, I think that's what they're doing. So That's definitely but, what they're doing. Right, yeah. It's 100% what they're doing. It's a slap lawsuit. I mean, yeah. there's... So anyway, so give us, the, give us the updates on what's going on, where are you at now, uh, what are your thoughts going on with this because I wanted to get you on here because... It's back circular again. You just started your GoFundMe page, and now uh, you got a thread on Reddit that's pretty popular. McDojo Life. I'm telling you some other ones to do. So, so what's the status, man? Uh, so first things first, I'd like to thank everybody that donated. I just checked. Uh, we're up to a hundred um, people donated, and a four point three thousand dollars raised. Nice, so that, that's incredible, man. That's awesome. Yeah, a hundred backers, and a lot of them were from overseas and people I don't even know. So kindness from like. Like utter strangers and uh, people in the local scene as well. Uh, I don't wanna, don't want to say any names, but you can scroll down and you can see uh, people who left their names, who left nice comments for me. I read them all. Uh, yeah, I check them all. So thank you so much uh, for the first. Yeah, it's the first time this has ever happened to me. So I'm very touched by the power of community, not just local but international as well. We have people from the US donating. They don't even know me, and they're yeah, just trying to protect the community, man. So BJJ community. Yeah, the, the, the global martial arts community is the best community in the world. Yeah, uh, it's I, crazy. I really stand by that, which is why you get so much positive feedback when you post shit like this. And it's why anywhere that I travel, the first place I always go to is a martial arts gym. Because the people that train jujitsu, particularly, but martial arts in the general sense, the people that go and they do that in their spare time tend to be some of the coolest communities in the world. So if you're listening to this and you can help Alvin, please uh, get a hold of him. If you can help share, post any of the information that you get, please do. Because. Uh, you know, this, this whole incident is just ridiculous. And I can't believe you're fighting this battle on your own. Because one of the things that I wanted to bring up is uh, I found an old Facebook post today. And I screen grabbed it. Because basically, you're the one that's shouldering all the weight of this. But you were not the first person to start this. And you weren't even the first person to bring it up and get a lot of attention. I got a post here on a, a BJJ Singapore community, community Facebook site. group. Yeah, Facebook group. This is from April 23rd. 2019 okay so april 23rd and by the way this post has tons of comments it's got tons of likes uh it's a lot of people seen this already so this was in april 23rd when did you post your your video uh 21st september 21st september so several months later several months yeah you just shared the thing that happened to sort of get viral and then because of that even though this was well known within the community you're the one having to bear the brunt of all of this stuff so we appreciate you yeah. Taking the flag on this one and, and running home, you know. It's okay though. Uh, so I mean, I, I'm not entirely like, we, like without fault. Like those guys did things the right way. They privately messaged him, and I wouldn't have been so pissed off if if like it was just out of the blue, like me calling him out. But the thing is, he has been warned like multiple times by multiple people. So he's still doing it, and he's still doing it now. I heard still doing it now. I think he's wearing a blue belt. Yeah. Well, to share, I mean, guys, th- this community that i'm sharing from you is locked i can assure you that it's real and even on this community uh, let me see if i can find the the post again shit balls i lost it um but even on the the facebook group picture that i saw the top comment was somebody saying that uh he this guy 
I'm not going to say his name. You can find it easily. It's already on all, yeah. over, all over the social media. But this guy, people have been asking him to step down, to stop doing this, told him not to wear the belt that he's wearing, mm -hmm. saying that he's not qualified. This is all going back to way before you said anything. Yeah. And then you're somehow stuck with the lawsuit because... Because I made it public. Yeah, you made it public. Yeah, but hey, when, when so many people like messaged him privately and tried to resolve the issue, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. Sorry, blah, 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 blah. And he doesn't do it. After a couple of months, he, he keeps teaching. And I've seen videos of him teaching women and children. And he's teaching like, he's offering to teach people like jujitsu and wrestling and things like this. And this is all like, like out there. You can, you can find it even right now on his um, Instagram page. It isn't public. So if he didn't block you, you can find footage of him teaching women mm. and it's like teaching women how to shrimp and shit like this you know so i sent all of them to mcdojo life and yeah th uh, shout out to mcdojo life for reposting it yes so. shout out to you <laughs> and also anyone else <laughs> anyone else that's got any of those videos because he took down a lot of them yeah a lot he, of them after he because i saw a lot when the f story first went out from ones that i guess were still public mm -hmm. and then he went and deleted a lot of those so guys if you can if you have access to any of those if you're in any of the the chats that are sealed or protected and you have access to those videos, please send them along because there's a lot of really good ones. And by good, yeah. I mean shit ones that I can't find anymore. Did you watch the one where he was trying to do a knee bar but he applied pressure? Oh, yeah, yeah, I watched that <laughs> So if you guys want to see, if you guys want to see what this dude's deal is, there's a really good Reddit post that you can get where you can still see a lot of these videos. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up on my phone really quick. And uh, I'll link you guys the Reddit thing. And you can go through a whole list. There's like several hundred comments. This was like the first one you posted that went sort of viral on Reddit. Yeah. And a lot of people started commenting and they started sharing pictures and videos of him training. And I mean, it's just a disaster. This is the tip of the iceberg, though. He's this deleted a lot of it, but uh, we managed to save a couple. I think I have a handful, but a lot of it is gone. But I should have saved everything. But you don't know, right? You never yeah, know yeah. how these things are going to go. I don't want to have these kind of like shitty techniques in my phone. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't want to poison your phone with those techniques. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole thing is just crazy, man, because the, the thing that annoys me the most about this, because, okay, let's, let's break this down for anybody that's new that's listening to this. Basically, the, the long story short in a nutshell is that Alvin called this guy out publicly on so social media, basically, and said that he, his skills are not good enough that uh, he's wearing a brown belt. And I should say that with that brown belt, there's a lot of controversy. But the issue, ultimately, I think, in terms of the legal process here, is that one, this guy's skills are not up to snuff. And two, but he did get certified by someone who he paid for the belt right, to. Right. So this is, the, this is where it gets difficult, right? Because if the question is, is he qualified in the strictest terms, the answer is yes. But in no way does that mean you are necessarily qualified just because you're wearing a brown belt? 100%, yep. And I mean, clearly, this is why the Singapore jiu-jitsu community is so fervent in supporting you, which is why you have 100 plus supporters, which is why your posts keep going viral because people keep sharing them. Right. Because anybody that's a basic layman can look at those techniques and see that his techniques aren't up to snuff. If you go back and you look at his technique videos, you can find comments from at least five black belts in Singapore. Yeah. And more brown belts and more purple belts. And I have not seen a single person s vouch for this guy. And furthermore, I haven't heard anything of him ever rolling with anybody since all of this happened that can alleviate any of this stress. He trains at a gym. If he's wearing a brown belt, he must have rolled with somebody. I mean, you have all of these people in the community that are going out against this guy. Where are the people that can vouch for him? I've been in this community for seven years. I've rolled with every motherfucker on this island, right? Like you just don't get to be here this long and train this long and not train with a brown belt. Yep. Like they've competed or they've rolled together. Even at the UFC gym, like there's no blue belt or purple belts that are, I've heard some white belts come out and say, hey, is this and this, yeah. and, but I've never heard anybody with authority in the community that you can really, that can vouch for him. Yes, I agree. And most tellingly, he hasn't come out to defend himself yes, at all. Yes, exactly. Right? So if you don't defend yourself, like, what does it say? You know, I've heard that he wants to compete at the next SGBGO. Oh, really? Yeah, but I don't think so. I think uh, <laughs> it's just I mean, that's shit. your tournament. So that yeah. would be, Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting. Well, it's what I said in the last podcast. If the guy came to my gym, I would roll with him and I would give you and everyone an honest assessment, 100%. Yep. If he's fucking good, I would say he's fucking good. Mm -hmm. And if he's not, I, I would say he's not. And I would tell him exactly based on my experience what his skill level is. And I will tell you, and I said it in the last podcast, that I spoke to somebody who has a, is a coach at his gym, is a black belt, that yeah. told me that he's like blue belt, le white blue belt level. 
the, the coach. Yeah. So I'm not going to say his name, but this is coming from the guy, one of the guys who works at the UFC gym, told me what his level is. Yep. Uh, it's not blue belt level, man. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, this is the coach. Yeah, so yeah. Saying what, but even still, like blue belt and brown belt is a huge jump. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge jump. I mean, yeah. it's double to triple the experience. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's not legit. If he wants to compete, he can come over and he can test his skills, you know? Yeah, I mean, no one's going to. Yeah, I just feel like he should defend himself instead of having the UFC gym defend him. And also, this is the guy you want to spend all of your time and energy defending w- with lawsuits like this guy? Yeah. Uh, that's what I don't understand. Uh, I was surprised, but no, I'm not surprised because I've heard even more stories uh, of how... how uh, I don't know, man. I'm not surprised by any of these guys anymore, you know? Uh, I don't think this is how you're supposed to run, like, a business. So, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. But, uh, yeah, I'm prepared to fight all the way till the end. So, what exactly are they suing you for? What, what does it say on uh, the paper? Libel. I think I should post the lawyer's letter online. Like, yeah. the, lo- the letter they sent me. So, uh, they're suing me for $48,000 worth of damages. $48,000 yeah, yeah. worth of damages? Yeah. Uh, 48 plus plus Dude, plus. this is... Bullshit. Mm-hmm. This is fucking bullshit. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's it's a hundred percent a slap lawsuit. They're just trying to bully you and intimidate you. And in fact, I wanted to share this with you because I'm not going to say any names, but you probably saw this. I think you were tagged in the post in the post, so let's not do it. Okay. But I'm going to talk to you again about why these slap law sh- uh, lawsuits are bullshit, right? Because here's a case we have of a guy who. The whole community, not you, from multiple gyms, from multiple places across, and not even within Singapore, but the people that saw the videos on Reddit, international. this internationally, all are saying the same thing about this guy, yeah. right? And I have nobody uh, locally that I can talk to that says anything differently, right? So this is not just the local community, but it's the international community coming out on this guy. Now, the word gets out that you're being sued, and then the whole point of a slap lawsuit is to intimidate, is to try to stop people from openly criticizing right? To put so much pressure on you that you won't talk. And I found out another really interesting story about a fucking creepy jujitsu instructor that worked nearby. He used to work in JB. Oh, you know, okay. you, I know okay, you know, okay. you were tagged into the thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's this, I'm not going to say his name, but I'll give you all the hints because I don't give a fuck. So I'll give you all the hints and then you can assume he's a, he was a jujitsu instructor that used to work in JB at reps. I'll even call it. And he's competed here in a tournament. And there was a post online about this guy being a fucking creep and threatening women. I mean, yeah. it, there was no dispute. He was clearly threatening to like, hurt this woman. Yeah, I saw the messages. Yeah, you saw them. And it was just a, a Facebook post going back and forth of a jiu-jitsu instructor, a big, tall, strong, athletic jiu-jitsu instructor threatening a woman, th- threatening to go to her and find her and like, all this fucked up shit because he um, was talking about her tits and he was being like super fucking aggressive and creepy. And then, you don't know this, right? And then after that, I found out from another girl that's local that he was also perving on. I'll tell you after who that is. But, okay. but someone we know very closely who he was sending super aggressive, pushy, like rapey messages to. Yeah, no surprise. But so, and the point of this is, is in the bottom of those comments, people were saying they don't want to make it public because they're afraid of the whatever. The backlash. Yeah, but fuck that. Like this well, guy's a what's creep. What's going to happen? You know? I don't know, but, but exactly is what's happening is this thing is happening with you. It makes people worried. And then there's a genuine fucking creep in our community. Like he comes to Singapore all the time and yeah. he's in JB and he's all through Malaysia and he's tours through Asia. He's, he's going to be teaching. JB? Uh, I don't know if he's in JB now, but he's touring. He tours yeah. through Asia all the time. Mm. And then he's going to be teaching somebody's wife and somebody's girlfriend and somebody's fucking kids. And this guy's a creep and yeah. nobody wants to talk about it because they're afraid of being sued. Yeah, it reminds me of the Josh situation a little bit, yeah. right? Uh, I've never, I've, I've never actually spoken with this guy we're talking about. I've spoken with Josh, and I never had any inclinations at all. I think I've told you about it. So, I think this is why it's very important for the community to like police its own because there's no checks and balances in martial arts, especially in Asia, right? So, like, there's no like athletic commission. There's no like Nevada states thing. So, you have to take into account like what people who have been in the scene for 15 years, like yourself are saying you know so it is very if i was the gym that's suing me i wouldn't just brush this all under the table and like oh we know everything the problem with like so many things is that this this gym is or like a lot of things that's wrong with um martial arts is that it's run by people who don't train i think yeah. I, 
And it's not always a bad situation, but these people who don't train need to take in feedback from people who've been in the scene, you know? So that's my, that's my take on this. But yeah, that's quite a ridiculous situation, huh? Yeah, it makes things difficult for you dealing with a lawsuit because, I mean, who's going to look at your lawsuit? It's going to be somebody who doesn't know what they're looking at. It's going to be somebody who doesn't understand the nuance. And this is why it's really important that the community pushes, like, pushes hard back against this because yeah. the person, the lawyer that the UFC gym is hiring to do this lawsuit against you and the, the courtroom that's going to hear it are not going to understand the nuances of what constitutes a brown belt because what constitutes a brown belt anyway is very abstract and it's, it's sort of hard to say what's a brown belt well to a lot of people it's something different and as the educated community looks at that you can see just based on your experience that the body's not moving the right way the reactions aren't there even when he's drilling and some people are like oh well but when he's moving you don't know what kind of dr training they're doing no you can you can tell yeah you can just tell when you look at it but how do you convince somebody who doesn't know what they're looking at that this is this guy's not qualified to be doing what he's doing? You have to go to the community. But what but if the community doesn't really unite, then it's not gonna be enough to overpower a, a, a an expensive lawyer who's yeah. trying to feed information My to lawyer is expensive. Know. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's the move. Uh, yeah, I have a good lawyer, so shout out to my lawyers. Uh, yes, uh, that's a good point, actually. I have to sit down with my lawyers and explain to them in detail, like, what... Like, th they asked me to send them the belt levels in jiu-jitsu and things like this. So I have to send them, like, what does a white belt represent? What does a blue belt? So, yeah, it's very cool. Um, so, we are using two defenses. Uh, I, think, I think I can say this. So, one is justification, which is, uh, yes, he's not a brown belt, right? So, we have to justify that he's not a brown belt. And the second one is... I forgot a term for it, but um, something that you have to let the public know, which which means it's like it's like fair use. Um, mm. That I have to say this because he's he's a fake, you know. I'm not just saying it to to destroy the company. I'm saying this because hey, this is a fake guy, and people have to know about this. So we're running with this defense, and I have very good lawyers on my team. Mm. They're actually the same lawyers for uh, So Ru Yong. So I don't know if you're he's like a famous marathoner here. So I have good lawyers. That's why they cost like 25k. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good because this, I mean, this is a really tricky issue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that's why, I mean, y you've, you've snagged onto a little bit of the viral thing that you can get to in the community, which is nice. But I want you to get a whale. You know, I want you to get like the, the Bullshito whales and the McDojo Life whales. And we keep this story going because it, it really does take the community outreach to, you have to win over the public because in the actual courtroom it's going to be very tough to make this case because he does have a certificate and I personally spoke to the guy that gave him the certificate and he was being fucking weird. He was saying weird shit. Okay. He was like telling me that this guy w was promoted to a brown belt and then he goes, uh, but if he, but if he stopped training and his skills declined, that's not his fault. He told me about that. And I'm yeah. like, dude, that doesn't happen. I don't think this guy's a black belt. I don't know whether we're talking about the right guy. I don't want to say any names, but, uh, I talked to both. Okay. To both on okay. his search. So one one of them is a real black belt. That's the the ultimate, the higher yeah. one, right? Yeah. The other one is a. I don't think he's a real black belt. Yeah, I, I think he's a hapkido black belt, masquerading as a jiu-jitsu black belt. You can defend yourself if you want, and I'm already in trouble, so I don't give a shit. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't think this guy's a real black belt. Uh, he gives off some fishy vibes. Uh, yeah. And a, a jiu-jitsu black belt will never put in his bio hapkido black belt, da 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 black belt, jiu-jitsu black belt, right? It just I don't know I don't know I've heard from people who have done some snooping that he may not be a real black belt so you can't promote someone to brown belt if you're not a real black belt right so yeah I don't I don't know about that the guys we spoke to it was in a it was pretty thick Portuguese but he he was just saying some weird shit and he was like oh I gave him this belt but he's like it's not a competition belt the competition is different and then he goes if his skills decline that's not his fault like right away he was just making a lot of excuses for why and I'm like dude like. Nobody does that. Yeah. Like if you, if I give somebody a brown belt and I mean, I just gave somebody a brown belt yesterday. Like I give somebody a brown belt. I'm not going to be like, and when they make, Hey, what's this guy's skill? I'm not gonna be like, Oh, well, you know, it's <laughs> kind of, I just gave it. It's not a competition brown belt. It's like, yeah, I fucking gave him the brown belt. Like it reflects on you, right? Yeah. I mean, I would never, you have to make excuses for somebody. One that shows you don't know them that well. Yeah. And, and two, you, you're not really confident in the quality that they, you won't give anybody a brown belt who's, who you have not known for like, and trained with like extensively, you know, it's a brown belt. So yeah, he's wearing a brown belt with a red sash. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah. That's an that's instructor. So weird. 
as an instructor that session, qualifies right? an instructor yeah yeah so yeah and uh yeah i mean there's so much weirdness to this story but i, I encourage you guys all to let me let me give a link out so Alvin, yeah. where can people find? First of all, if you haven't listened to it, you can listen to the first episode of the podcast. We go into the sort of the is this preliminary. Still the best doing podcast. It's the best. It's the best podcast. Okay, because you need to you, know. you need to explain. It takes time. You can't just share like a little clip on social yeah, media yeah. and shit like that. But give us some details, man. I, I want to get people the details. So when you first, like, give me some names. Give me some people that support you. Like, sort of make your case for me, if you will, here a little bit, so everybody can understand the beginnings of this and, and where you're at now. So right at the beginning, uh, like the I'm beginning gonna, of this. I'm going to get us a beer too. I'll be right back. Yeah, you sure. Talking, yeah. Uh, okay. So the beginning of the story, it started this way. Uh, in April, I believe Luke was saying, uh, in BGJ Community Singapore, a, face, a private Facebook group with about like 500 people, uh, it was it was exposed or it was brought to the matter that this guy was masquerading as a jiu-jitsu practitioner where he's not. La. So there's a lot of people in the scene uh, I don't want to say any names, but a lot of people in the scene, well-regarded people, people who have been training for more than 10 years, uh, privately texted him, and I've seen those screenshots that he is of, like masquerading as a jiu-jitsu player and he's teaching women and children. So uh, he's apologized. He said he's going to take down his belt, but he didn't. And when in September, I woke up one morning... So wait, he apologized. Why did he apologize? He apologized so... I can show you the screenshots, man. I think I've sent them to McDojo Life. I think they reposted it. Uh, the, have him apologizing for it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He's like, it's sorry, on the link man. That you, that you shared earlier? I think so. I think so. Otherwise, I could show it to you later. Yeah, he he was like, sorry. Uh, yeah. So what else did he say? Keep on going. I'm just going to find this. Um, I'm just going to find this link so I can give everybody the Reddit post. So he's apologized to the people that texted him and... He, he never outright said he was a fraud, but he... Why would you apologize for wearing a belt if you're not, like, that belt, right? So... And then there's the videos of him, the pictures of him wearing on a white belt. Yeah, for sure that he's not... Yeah, yeah. He, he was wearing a white belt at the same time as he was wearing a brown belt. He was wearing a white belt because an instructor was there. So... Yeah, yeah. and then later on he appeared in the brown belt, and then also that instructor is the one that I spoke to. Oh, okay. So I spoke to the guy who... Well, we got it, guy. Yeah. yeah, who told him not to wear that fucking belt, so. <laughs> yeah. So, these guys are just bullshitting. And if you're not bullshitting, if you have anything to say, you would stand on and defend yourself. You know, my social media accounts are pr uh, public. You know where I stay. Um, you can find me in the gym anyway. You can find me here right now. And he's, not standing, he's not standing up for himself. So. Yeah, I mean, I've literally not heard a peep. Yeah. And you know what's funny, too, is uh, another thing that I, th I fear is going to be lost on the the sort of the lawsuit is that he wasn't actually hired as a jiu-jitsu instructor. He was hired as a Muay Thai coach. Right but that's also laughable. Yeah, but I mean, still. You can see also, if you want to go even further into the story, there's videos of him holding pads for people. Mm -hmm. And Major and I discussed this on the podcast with, with, yeah, I've heard that podcast. with Major. And he was talking about, like, the, I mean, the guy's getting flack because the brown belt. The good thing about jiu-jitsu, right, is that the, the jiu-jitsu, uh, the, the belts are a really powerful symbol. Mm -hmm. And when you see people wearing the symbol, you, it, it, it's a bit like wearing your degree on your waist. Yes, yeah, so that's a good analogy. Right? Yeah. It's like, so that, that's a, a visual, powerful symbol of your competency in the, the associated skills, yeah. right? And in Muay Thai, you can kind of cheat. Yes. Because there's no, there's no belts, which is, you see a lot of this. I would argue that the Muay Thai people and the boxer people, those are the ones where it's very hard to judge the quality. Because there's no ranks associated with it. You can just do whatever, and then you can, you can get, like, level one or level two from Evolve for, like, six, eight months of training, and then all of a sudden you're a Muay Thai coach, right? You can just run a certification program from anybody, like, pet holding, yeah. certificate, boom. Yeah, I mean, Major coach. was saying that you can just go to Thailand and take a crew course, yeah. and then all of a sudden you can call yourself fucking crew, whatever, yeah. right? Crew, white person name, or whatever, whatever yeah. the fuck, <laughs> you know? You can just call yourself a crew. And that also... Major made a point of saying that, like, this guy should not be a fucking Muay Thai coach. So yeah. it, it's the whole package. And this is a guy that his body moves like a fraud. Like, you can just see it when he's holding the pads, when he's rolling. It's like that, that body does not move like a skilled martial artist. 100%. Anybody who puts master in front of his name 
is a fraud. Like ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, here's I'm here's the all the people that don't train out out there. So if anybody puts master in front of their name, ninety nine percent of the time they're lying. Right? They're not a master of anything. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even tell my students to call me professor, because it sounds creepy and I fucking hate it. <laughs> is I, it? I get culty vibes from it, honestly. Mm. And like, I just want to shut that shit down. Don't call me professor. Don't call me master. Don't call me. Just call me by my fucking name. So people who want to be called that. Yeah, there's, there's something a little pathological there. And someone who puts a fucking Facebook post of themselves holding fake knives and shit yeah. like that. It's I'm just going to make fun of you, dude. I'm sorry, man, but that's fucking stupid. Go to, go to, okay, so I got the Reddit. Guys, please, go to the Reddit. Uh, if you go to RBJJ, the name of the, the title of the article is UFC Gym Singapore Hires Fake Brown Belt Then Threatens to Sue the Guy That Revealed It. You can find that. It's two months ago on uh, RBJJ. It's got like 650. There's a new one now. There's a new one There's now. There's a new one. Like I think it's uh, UFC Singapore. They really are suing or something like uh. that. So I've been commenting on that one for a little bit. Guys, please go to the subreddit and look through the comments. Yeah. Okay, because there's like uh, the one that I just said. This is the old one. has got 234 comments. If you go through those comments, there are pictures. There are videos. There's people. There's of the whole international community giving their opinion on this this situation. Yep. Not and one of them has anything good to say. So Many. What does that and tell this you? is across multiple platforms. It's across Reddit, it's across Facebook, it's across and then the martial arts outlets are starting to pick it up now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to hit up more more guys. I'm going to make sure this whole thing is known and Here's the thing about me, right? Uh, you were saying just now that um, I'm kind of taking the brunt of it from, from the local scene and everything. And I don't mind, man. I, I don't even care if I lose this whole thing. Of course, I don't want to lose. But what's the worst they can do to me? Like, uh, so I get sued. I'm getting sued for $48,000. And uh, if I lose, I have to pay for their lawyer and my lawyer. And I'm going to go bankrupt, right? I don't give a shit, man. It's, it's more important to... What? I'm going to be discharged in like five to seven years. It's more important to stand up for you, believe you. I'm going to be like 30 years old. I don't give a fuck. You know? So, yeah. Well, it's definitely important to, to stand up for what you believe in. It's just, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the whole reason that the lawsuit is bullshit and it's clearly a slap lawsuit is just because you mm. are not the first person to say this. Yeah. You're just the person that everybody saw say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy that made it public. Yeah, you're the guy that made it public, but the, the rumors have been swirling about around this guy, and there's evidence of this. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they getting sued? I mean, I kind of understand that, you know, the idea of any of this stuff is you got to crack an egg to make an omelet. Someone has to be the first person to go, even if they weren't yeah. saying it. But that, that's why it's really important that the, the martial arts community gets behind you. Guys, just go through the, the comments on the, the Reddit and on the McDojo Life stuff. Because even the, the McDojo Life one, when was that shared? Like yesterday, right? Yesterday while I was sleeping. Yeah, yesterday while you were sleeping. And already on the Facebook, there were hundreds of comments. Yeah. 6,000 something views, I think. I... Just on his technique video. I got like 300 new followers from his saga alone, which is like weird. Like people I don't know, just internationally, like people from the States, like dropping me like nice, just texting me nice things, you know, hey man, we're behind you, just donated like $20. Da, da, da. It's so it's so heartwarming. So there's a silver lining to it is that I managed to, in my small way, just unite people. And I think that's very cool. And thank you guys for getting behind me, man. And yeah, I'll be fighting this all the way. Yeah, well, it's one of the most important parts of the jiu-jitsu culture is the the self-policing like you were talking about earlier yeah because there is no police right there's no one that can really objectively say if you're breaking the rules if you're not breaking the rules if you're a fake if you're not a fake but nonetheless you can go through like youtube and just find videos of yes. with millions of hits millions of hits of these people being exposed mm -hmm. and i don't want this guy to be exposed i think i mean my opinion of it if i'm honest of this guy is that he's probably a guy who's trained off and on for like five years, seven years, here and there, occasionally, got his blue belt, wanted to become an instructor, and then just found somebody that he could pay every couple years to come and promote him. And, you know, he would train here and there and all that kind of stuff, and he wants the authority of being a, a black belt or a brown belt or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's finding somebody that's making him go through the least amount of hurdles as possible. Like, oh, bro. Next year, two years, I come, we train, blah, blah, blah. I promote you. Okay, no problem. You pay for my flight. We go here. We do this. We do that. And then, you know, every couple of years, he brings him in, and then he's just doing that without the training. And it's not the right way to. So. No, it's certainly not, which is why people are commenting on it. And yeah. But, man, how does it feel? It must. I imagine for you it's quite roller coaster ish uh, because yeah, it's the legal threat, but then you post something, and then you get really positive response back from the community. So, how does it feel for you, man? Like, 
Uh, it's not even about that. So it's like, uh, hmm, that's a good question. So I'm dealing with a lot of things right now. So it's just. Like and you're also sorry to interrupt, but you're also organizing a tournament. Yeah, exactly. You're organizing an amateur MMA tournament, which we'll talk about soon. And and all the while you're fighting this lawsuit and then just I trying to do your actual thing. Actual fight coming up as well. Oh like yeah, and you're fighting belt. for a title. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, See, so that's what I'm saying. This podcast, yeah. we, uh, we don't have enough time, dude. Yeah, man. So I'm just juggling a lot of things. So uh, the lawsuit doesn't really weigh much on my mind. It's just that uh, at first I was like stressed. I was like, oh, shit, law. But uh, like, <laughs> law. <laughs> Fuck law. Uh, like I was saying to a lot of my friends, like, like screw it. Um, man, I, I think they really picked the wrong guy. They like, just picked the crazy guy to sue because it's always been like a bucket list thing for me to go to court. Like, what? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's the like, craziest like, fucking bucket list I've ever heard. I, I don't know. I, you only live once. Really so. turns me on to be sued, everybody. I just. Man, not necessarily, but I just want to try. Hard. Like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before I die, I just want to see like what it's like in the courtroom. Well, you know, get it out of the way when you're young, hey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of when you're old and have plenty of money. So yeah, but uh, I was stressed for a while, but the support is really like mollifying. It's really humbling, actually. I'm like, wow, I'm just this like kid, um, and this is the transformative power of martial arts. You know, you just get to be exposed to a wider community. It's, all sorts of people that you would never had the chance to get to speak with and I'm, I'm glad to be part of this and organizing tournaments and things like that yeah, yeah i mean i would say that the asian martial arts community is just one of the most interesting and dynamic and compassionate sort of how would you say little sub communities that you can get i mean there's a sub community for everything right like yeah. whatever your interests are you can find a community for it. You want to cosplay. You want to be a fucking furry. You want to like whatever crazy shit you're into. You into gardening, into whatever. There's a there's a sub community of people who are like minded. Yeah. And there's something about the the martial artists in Asia in particular that that community is just so tight. Right. In Singapore, it's even like more unique. I would argue because it's so small. It's such a small place, but it's like dense and it's growing very fast. I heard your podcast with Dr. Ellen, mm. and I agree with uh, what you and him were saying that. Football is not Singapore's uh, national sport. It's martial arts. Right. For sure. Yeah. He said it's fucking studying. I just dep- <laughs> that just depressed me, man. Uh, He's like, yeah, exams are the exams. national sport. <laughs> I'm like, bro, bro, come on, man. Yeah, it's not a passion. Listen, man. I'm a fan of school, and I think education is important, but it's not a fucking sport, man. Yeah, I, and I think we are still, like, in its infancy. We're going to get even bigger. The next 10 years will be unrecognizable. Yeah, and you know, about this UFC gym thing, one of the things that upsets me more than anything is that th- they've sort of alienated the entire community other than themselves in this whole right. process. Yeah. Because, like, bro, I mean, like, I own a gym. I've had, I've had four instructors from different gyms on my podcast alone. Mm. Like, it, like, we're a tight community. I mean, me and Major are good friends. I train with a bunch of people. I trained at Evolve for two years. Uh, Trifecta is still open. I was a teacher there. Like, all the instructors, every, we all know each other. Like, I've got friends. Polino is at Juggernaut. Like, mm-hmm. Rahul, I train with him. We're all training together. We're all living in this community tightly. My hair is on the podcast. All the Impact guys, the Juggernaut, the Highlight Reel, Trifecta. Yeah, shout out to all those guys. All those fucking people, right? Yep. And we're all, like, kind of in this together and we all support you and what you're doing and i saw bruno amarim shared your shit he's from gracie baja of course me and major and leke from highlight reel impact you've got all these people supporting you and the ufc gym is standing on the side ignoring all of the community that they're a part of yeah for this guy they do how they do for exactly so. it's like they're just ignoring the entire community I mean, bro, you got 100 donations in Singapore, $4,000 over a fucking lawsuit that nobody knows about in Singapore yeah. on a subject that does not transcend the, the zeitgeist, right? I mean, this is such a niche issue. Oh, someone said that someone's a fake brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Like, 99% of the people in Singapore, they don't know what half those words International mean. International uproar. Yeah. yeah, but you've made enough within the community and internationally to get backers that you don't even know, yeah. let alone from our community, and these fuckers are still going for this. I just don't understand it. They've put themselves in a weird situation, but they, they can't go back on their words now, right? They're like, oh, but I don't know. Uh, it's war now, so. I don't know, man. The whole thing, the, the, this is what bums me out, is that the community is such a unique and spectacular aspect of the martial arts culture. Yeah. And then to have this gym on the side... It's sort of doing its own thing and then suing people within the community for criticism. 
I mean, that's the whole nature of this art mm -hmm. is criticism. Right. It's looking at yourself. Constructive criticism. Constructive criticism. Having a coach. Like, man, when you've sparred three or four or five rounds and you're getting fucked up and you're getting crushed and, like, you came in after work and then, you know, it's all the color belts there and you're the white belt and you're like, oh, God. And you work for eight hours and then you're going to come in and you're going to get choked and strangled and armbarred for, like, an hour and a half. And then after all that's done, you got to go home and then deal with the wife or the kids or the studying or whatever the fuck. Like, that's what makes this community so special is that these people seek discomfort mm. in the time in their life when they could seek comfort. And it bonds us in this really interesting and unique way, which is why the jiu-jitsu community is so tight. And then to go against that for because you feel criticized, like, it's the nature of what we do. Oh, someone criticizes one of your instructors, so you sue them for fifty thousand dollars in damages because you don't like what that person said, yeah. bro. If somebody criticized me, like we got a fucking we we got an uh, issue with somebody over uh, private lessons. Some woman came, took private lessons with us, and got injured, and then she wanted mm -hmm. to refund her private lessons, and she booked it with her husband. And I was like, okay. You can, I'll refund yours, but your husband has to continue to train because it's non-refundable. Once you pay and you sign up, you got to pay or you got to continue to do it. And, you know, we got a fucking one-star review and shit online for that. It doesn't feel good. I'm not going to sue her because she gave yeah. me a one-star review. Like, you can take criticism without being a fucking asshole. Like, I agree. Uh, I think a big problem is a, a lot of the management, I think, don't train, which is what I was talking about. So they don't really get, and I've seen... So I, I know some of the students there and a couple of them text me and I, I've heard like what they were telling the students and it's just bullshit. It's uh, just like, like, what are you? They're, they're like, oh, who's Elvin to say like these guys are brown belt and da, 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 da. But they oh, don't even train. What was the thing that they said to you the other day that you were, you trained at the UFC? What was the thing you shared? Oh, so what was this shit that they said? So apparently, I don't know who started the rumor, but I think you can take a guess that I used to teach for the UFC gym. Oh, okay. that's what it was. Yes. Okay. Or I used to be an employee there or something. Okay. Yeah, where okay. did this come from? <laughs> if anybody can pull out a pay slip no, and dude, prove that. That never happened for sure. <laughs> Ask come Leke on. or Major or any of the people that you train yeah, with. If yeah. you were a secret employee of the UFC gym, I'm pretty sure. So there's conspiracies already about how you're... So what happened was uh, when they first started... My girlfriend, now ex, wanted to teach yoga. So she's a freelance instructor, right? So we were asking around for rates and things like this. So it was the close, And I was asking like five gyms. So it was the closest I've ever came to working with them. You colluded with them, you motherfucker. <laughs> You've been lying this whole time. I'm going to run away to yeah, Thailand for $4,000. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the fuck, man? May are you secretly this guy? What's the brown belt? Are you, are you actually I just him? put on a mask. Yeah, brown dude. <laughs> Pose with some knives, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, right? Oh, my God, the knife picture, man. Guys, please, God, go to Reddit. Look at the picture. I feel bad because I don't want to insult the man. Yeah. But if you take yourself you should so defend seriously yourself, bro. that you post a profile picture of yourself holding two fucking sticks like you're about to beat somebody with the sticks, mm. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, yeah, everybody, just start taking pictures of yourself with swords if you want to look tough. Yep. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, anyway, so you're not you're not a UFC gym shill. No. You're not a you're not a disgruntled ex employee. Yeah. That's so crazy. I was like, what? <laughs> Conspiracies, dude. Yeah. When you start getting popular like that. Okay. Let's let's make a hard segue. Although okay. it's not so hard because we can go back to this, right? I, I want to continue to talk about this, and please feel free to talk at any point. But you got a lot of shit going on, man. Yeah. So yeah. I want to touch on some good stuff too, not some the legal troubles, but Thank you. I, I heard that you're fighting for a title coming up pretty yes, soon. Uh, so give us details on that, man. Wow. So I haven't fought in like four years, I think. So you fought time. the last time I fought, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That was God, the last I time I fought. So I haven't fought in a while that? too, dude. Four I'm years? I'm fucking lazy, I okay, guess. 2017? No, 2015. SFC. No, it was after that. 16? The SFC I fought on? I thought it was 16. 2016. SFC 3. So yeah, that was it. Uh, and I've just been not fighting cause, so I've had four fights right three of them were while I was in NS so I, I really couldn't train for them at all so I lost my last fight so I'm three and one so I always wanted to I always knew that I was capable is this pro? no amateur, uh, amateur still, okay. so I always knew I was capable for, of like more than that so um, I guess this is a good time to prove it yeah why not yeah. You, you got time to train yeah 
Um, so I'm what's fighting, the deal? Where are you fighting? Who? In Penang. I'm fighting this guy called oh, nice. Fikru. Uh, he's he's the champ there. So I'm gonna take his belt. Oh shit! Yeah, uh, yeah, what yeah. weight are you fighting at? Um, flyweight. Oh god. Real, yeah. How what do you weigh now? I've just heard today that weigh-ins on the same day. Oh. Ooh. So That's a problem, I'm like sixty-two point eight, right okay. now. Yeah. What's so, what's flyweight in kilos? Uh, I think I have to make fifty-six point seven. So sixty-two to fifty-six. F- 57 yeah. that's okay that's that's not so bad you're lighter than i thought you were <laughs> are you or are you just lying right now no, i'm 62 are you fucking fat dude don't lie to me no man <laughs> jack bro <laughs> you're fucking fat bro i can see it no i'm just kidding yeah so yeah that's N- happening nice so what's the rules for the fight and do you um, know your opponent amateur mma he's undefeated uh he's on paper he's three and oh but he's had some exhibition fights so he's something like four and oh five and oh uh and he's a very interesting guy because he doesn't look that good from what I've seen him. Those are the deceptive people. Yeah. <laughs> um, they don't pass the eye test, but then they get in there. Fuck you he's Jack. Oh, okay. He's like oh, Jack. So he is Jack. Oh. Like, skill-wise, he's Malaysian? not that good. Malaysian. Mm. Yeah. Uh, lives in Penang, so he's the hometown boy. Mm. And uh, But he's beaten some really, really good guys. He's, mm. he's beat Brendan Tang uh, from Monarchy. He's a good boxer. Uh, decision him and choked, like, two other guys. Mm. So, we'll see. But, no offense, but... Whenever, whenever, like, if I fight you and you're a white belt, mm. I'm so fucking confident, man. Yeah. Like, it's like, okay, right? Like, not white belt, white belt, but, like, stylistically, like, skill-wise, you're a white belt. Like, I'm so confident, right? All you got to do is just train. That's all you can do. Yeah. It's like that, uh, I love that cr- classic Boss Rutten quote, right? That all you can really do if you want to ensure your victory is show up in shape. Yeah, that's a good all point. you can do. Because when you're in the fight, the only thing you can control is the cardio. Yeah. Because like, listen, man, when kicks and punches, knees start flying, submissions and scrambles and all that kind of shit, like over a long enough time, generally the more technical person will win. Yep. But the only way that you can actually, the only sort of money in the bank that you can give yourself is cardio. Because when you get in there, the skills are what the skills are. The training up to that point is done. You can't train anymore once you step in there. Mm. The only thing that you can do that actually creates an impact previous to stepping into the cage is the cardio. Your conditioning, how you shape your... Yeah, you you got to be able to go. You got to be able to go the whole time. Like the, the techniques are what they are. And if you're in really good shape then your techniques will be good to the third round, right? Or fifth round if it's a title fight or, yeah. or Five whatever. rounds of three minutes, this right. one. Yeah, it's so, I mean, if you, get, if you get tired, your technique slips. Yeah. So that's number 100%. one. Number two is when you get hit, your technique slip. I so, don't know. Right. So we'll that's, that's the second one. And then, of course, number three is if you just get tired, you just get tired. Yeah. So all of those things will affect you. The most important thing is just to be in good shape. He's, he's that's very, all you can give yourself. He's very yeah. conditioned. Then so you got to give him that. So yeah, you got to get that. Get then. in shape, push the pace, drink less beers. Yep. Because yeah. you can, when's, your, when's the fight? March 7th. Oh, so you got plenty of time. Right yeah. on. Wait, when's the SG BGG open? March, se- March 7th and 8th. Oh, right. I was going to say, is it yeah, the same fucking yeah. day? Same day, yeah. Okay, so I'm so not going to be there for this one. Oh, uh, okay. But I was like, that date sounds familiar. I don't know. Yeah, I got to do what I got to do, man. I got to yeah. focus on myself. Yeah, yeah that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. There, listen, dude, there will be tons more. Tons yeah. more fights, tons more competitions. You're young. Like, that shit's. Hopefully, I can bring back the belt, do another podcast. Take Absolutely. A picture, take dude. a picture with you, man. Yeah, I'll do a podcast with the champ. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you. I'll do it. Better get your ass in shape. That's Speaking it. Speaking of belts, uh, for Lion City Championship, we're gonna base our business model on belts. Mm. So that that's gonna be a good one. So, so uh, go ahead and outline what you're talking about yeah, for everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we so as Jiu Jitsu Open, so we've started a new company called Lion City Championships, and we are running amateur fights, predominantly MMA. So we're gonna create belts for each weight class. So it's gonna be, um, I think we need an amateur league in Singapore and just in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, so yeah, we're going to do that. Our first show is going to be late April to early May. So yeah, we're going to focus on that. What, how many weight classes are you going to do? Uh, for men's straw weight to light weight, I think. That sounds right. Yeah, I wouldn't do too many. Yeah. Keep it something that you can sustain. If you put a shitload of weight classes, it's going to be tough to yeah. keep the matches rolling. Yeah. What about how many how many shows are you thinking of doing per year? Maybe two this year. I want to focus on one first. Get yeah. straighten out the kinks this year, mm-hmm. and then next year is going to be bigger. Okay, yeah. cool. Hopefully, we can work together with some big guys like Juan or even UFC. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Get some... 
yeah, getting the first one out of the way is going to yeah, be because yeah, yeah. then that'll set the format, and then you'll kind of get an idea. You know, you organize a jujitsu tournament already. You know that getting that first one out is the first two out. I would say yeah. straighten out the kings. Yeah, get some right people. That's cool, man. I think that it's really important to have a good amateur league in Singapore. Thank and, you. And uh, you're 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 going to do some payment as well. Is that the yeah for sure? You're going to pay the fighters for sure. For I mean, listen, dude, if you're an amateur and you're getting paid, that's <laughs> all you can ask for really yeah, i think mima kind of like ruined everybody's expectations because they're paying like good money yeah i think it was like two thousand dollars or something but or they like. also did some shit stuff that didn't make any sense that's true i think i think what i bring to the table is that there's a lot of organizations around that um that are run by people who don't are not like really in the scene in the scene you know like i was listening to the dr ellen podcast mm. and that guy that died remember yeah like afc was doing the event they're defunct now so i think yeah. they talked about them it was so ridiculous. They shouldn't have done that. Um, Stephen Lim versus the, the, the Indian bodybuilder. bodybuilder, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. And so we, were, we were saying on the podcast, so again, for the listeners who don't know, I'll just re- give a little brief recap to give the story some context. Is it, what is it? Stephen Lim's a, he's like a YouTube guy, you, right? He's like an infamous kind of guy in Singapore. Like YouTuber. A, a sort of pseudo-celebrity in yeah, Singapore. Yeah, yeah, pseudo-celebrity is a yeah. good name. And he, he had a, you know, it would be kind of similar not to the same level but it's like the ksi logan paul type fight right yes it was like two kind of pseudo celebrities doing a boxing match youtube personalities or whatever and uh they were just gonna have a fight and you know kind of got a little famous or whatever unfortunately one of the guys was an indian bodybuilder type dude he stepped in last minute like in 24 hours yeah he stepped in last minute 24 hours like he did not have the cardio me and alan talked about it on the podcast the guy died from fatigue yeah he died from fatigue. He didn't get hit with anything that was so hard to, to. I mean, I don't even think he he didn't even get knocked out cold. No, I watched the fight, man. Yeah, you were there. I wasn't there. Or you but watched, I watched online. The fight. Yeah, I mean, I watched it too. But he just fatigued. He gassed out. And by the way, neither one of them were in great shape. Yeah. I mean, this this Indian guy is unfortunately the person who who died, and that was in Singapore, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Listen, man, if you die in a fight in Singapore, that's terrible. That's a big. That's a big story. Like it's so rare to have like sort of accidental deaths like that, and to have it fighting, and it's these two kind of local celebrity dudes, and then they just weren't in shape. And this guy, th- was it two rounds? Like he fought for five minutes or something. Yes, something like that. I mean, it wasn't I think that it was long. Like a round or two. I think it was yeah, a round actually. Yeah, it was like yeah. yeah, it was something like three to five minutes only, mm. and the um, the pressure of the fight was just so much that this guy died after the fight. Yeah, there's and something about fighting that makes people think they can do it. Not just fight, but like manage fighters or like open gyms. So I don't know. I was I may be a hiking bastard for saying this, but at that time I was like, like, man, like this is unfortunate. But I hope that this won't happen again. Or like somebody could take like lessons from this and not just fight. But would you agree that fighting is an extreme sport? It's like climbing a yeah, mountain. Yeah, it's the most extreme right? sport. So if I wouldn't climb like Everest with a day of training, what makes you think that you can fight with a day of training? This is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah they, those people do exist. Those people that try to climb Everest own a co- and they fucking die. Yeah. And There's this video of a Canadian woman who tried to climb Everest with like zero training and for, I think she trained for like a week, uh, a month or six weeks and then fucking died on the way down. Right. People I are mean, not surprised when that happens, right? Yeah. But when you die in a fight without any training, people are like, oh shit. Yeah. Like, and it's like, what? Like, <laughs> what? What do you think this is? Like, yeah. what do you think is going on here? Well, I, I told the story of, um, I mean, I really think if you die in a fight that there's two major concerns Mm -hmm. uh, major uh things that led up to that number one is what's your cardio level because that it uh, usually tends to be heart issues like remember when um when kimbo Kimbo slice Slice. fought dada 5000 right that dada 5000 guy he said he had a bunch of heart attacks on the way to the hospital and then uh kimbo also had a bunch of issues Uh, he may have both dead now too They're They're both dead dead now, but Dada, I think, survived that night and then died like a couple days later or something like that. And so it's usually the weight cutting is the Mm -hmm. second one or it's the the, the cardiovascular fitness. It's the cardio, man. Yeah, the cardio. I mean, people die from just not being in good enough shape and then getting in there and fighting. Listen, your body has to be conditioned for this shit. You can't just step in there, eat a head kick or like, (laughs) I mean, if I think of think of like, what could you do for five minutes that would kill you? There's not many things, right? Fighting is one of them. Yes. If you're out of shape and somebody beats the shit out of you, because it's not just the the cardio and the but it's the th- it's the stress that you get from the threat the violence. Adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. You ever like uh, I was doing this today. I was sparring with a few of my students, and today the the game for sparring was mm-hmm. I'm gonna pressure you nonstop, and you have to like try to stick and move and 
you know, counter, counter strike and all that shit. You ever done that? You ever spar with somebody who puts nonstop pressure on I you? Hate it. <laughs> Bro, it makes your cardio just go down. Don't tell my opponent it. <laughs> oh my God. Well, it's just, that's, that's the whole game of fighting, right? It's yeah. bullying somebody. And mm-hmm. if you let them, you know, in a fight, you can throw a hard one back and you get their respect yes, and yes. Then they'll back yeah. off you and shit. But in sparring, sometimes it's quite different. And man, if somebody's in your face and they don't take a step back and you're trying to push them and poke them and jab them and kick them, and, but they never step back, the cardio is one thing, but it just, boom, drops your cardio like 30 to 40%. Yeah. Just the stress of having somebody in your face and you're like, fuck you, and they won't, they won't back off at all and they're just always on you. It's a very good game. Even professional fighters wilt. Like when you fight the Diaz brothers, yeah, they just wilt. That's they the perfect keep example. Coming, keep coming, dang, 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 50% shots. Yeah. Colby? Yeah, Kobe. Kobe breaks people like that. Like yeah. just volume, volume stays in your face, never takes yeah. a step back. That's the shit that will kill you. <laughs> like that's the also shit just that the adrenaline. If you've never been in a fight before, and th- it's it's different, like street fighting or like fighting in your schools or whatever, and fighting in front of like a stadium full of people like yelling your name, and like just the entire stress of the event is different. Yeah, so yeah, you're gonna be feeling that pretty soon. Man, I'm feeling rather underwhelmed for this fight, to be honest. Give it time, man. I'm yeah. telling you, the, the week before and then the few days prior, you'll feel it. Yeah. It, it actually does get like that. Like, the more you fight, the less, first of all, the less stressed you get. That's, that's pretty obvious. That's with anything, right? Gradual exposure to anything will, over time, lead you to be slightly desensitized to whatever the activity is. Yeah. You know, which is good, because that's the whole point of being a seasoned fighter. You don't want to be too, like, underwhelmed. Yes, either. but yeah. it always comes before the fight. It the the actual I remember from my first amateur fight and my first pro fight I was just stressed out the whole time, and then after I did the second and the third one the point where the of maximum stress hit later and later and later and to a lesser degree and to a lesser degree but you'll you'll get okay. there it'll still come <laughs> I promise you man it'll still come it's just worth noting because I was like this I was like you all the time like even for jujitsu I would, I would get like super M I was mm. like oh shit it's time yeah. to go right uh I don't know. I'm still coming to win the win a belt. Yeah, you still got a few months though. The stress, the stress is important too. Yeah, it's not only negative; it serves a purpose, right? It keeps you honest. Yeah, makes you, you sharp. Get your shit together and yeah. stop the booze or the whatever the fuck it is that's stopping you from training. Everybody's got their their vice, right? And yeah. The threat of someone kicking your ass will get your shit together pretty quickly. What I think it is is I think just like dealing with this lawsuit and running like businesses has given me like a new experience with stress. I think like pressure makes diamonds. So I'm I'm dealing with pressure a lot better now. I think a lot of people, if they're new to it, wouldn't be able to take it. But like, like like having a fight is incredible pressure, right? Just for that couple of minutes and that two months leading up to the fight, cutting weight and everything. But yeah, it's all about dealing with pressure. And I think, I think I'm good at it. So we will see what happens in a fight. Well, don't stretch yourself too thin. Make sure you dedicate the training Anytime you take a fight, that's number one. Yeah, everything else, you. everything else has to be. Otherwise, you're not giving it the respect it deserves. Yes, right. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Life can get in the way, and you know the odd training session here and there. If you gotta, you gotta work. You gotta work. But you know, number one is your health, and mm-hmm. you know, just even like the Stephen Lim and this other dude, like you know, they didn't respect the game. And if you don't respect the game, like you look at it online, and you're like, I can do that shit. Like men are supremely, in particular, men are yes. supremely confident about their abilities to fight. Mm-hmm. And it most, most of the time, it's unwarranted. And that will get you in a lot of trouble. Because, uh, you know, you think, oh, this person is this, this person is this. They're small, they're weak, they're whatever the fuck they are. And that's just, listen, when you step in there, you got to pretend everybody's staring across the side of the ring is going to fuck you up. <laughs> like, that's, you got to have that fear. Yeah, 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 that's good for you. It's healthy for it's you. You, you can't let it overwhelm you, but it's definitely... It's definitely necessary. Yeah, I agree. Um, what was I going to say? I think the sport is so mainstream now. Like, it's grown so much in Singapore that um, people, this is what I've noticed. And it's it's a good thing. But when you're training, like, MMA here for fun or, like, jiu-jitsu for, for fun versus, like, an MMA fight or like, even a Muay Thai fight, a boxing fight, something like that, it, it's a different level of intensity. And I think there are people who who think they can do it, um, but it puts them in a lot of danger, man. Um, yeah, I just want to get that out there. Well, that's why you got to respect anybody who steps in there. Yeah, it's a fight, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I don't really treat it as a sport. Like, it's a fight. Yeah, well, it's that's... Like samurai shit. People that call jiu-jitsu competitions a fight, I kind of laugh at them because I'm like... I mean, it is because people will... People will fight 
in a jiu-jitsu competition as hard as they would if they were actually in a fight. But if you're not being punched or kicked or elbowed or kneed, or, it's just not. It's a competition. Yeah. It's a sport. It doesn't mean that it's not an aspect of... I, I, I mean, I guess I would call boxing a fight, too. Because the, the, I think you need the risk of getting knocked out for mm. it to be a fight. Because even like a jiu-jitsu competition, you get choked, you tap out, like whatever. The bo- if, you, if you take an MMA, a boxing, or a Muay Thai fight, you got to be ready to be hurt bad. It's not like a jiu-jitsu competition. Like, I, I don't classify that as a fight. People call them fights, and you know, I, I'm not a stickler on it. I don't really care, but dude, if somebody's not trying to knock your fucking head off, like, that feeling alone is so much more surreal and intense than like a jiu-jitsu competition. Like if a jiu-jitsu competition, it fits on a, ske- uh, a spectrum of 1 to 10. A jiu-jitsu competition is like a four or a five. And then I would say that a boxing fight is a little bit higher. But an MMA fight, like especially a pro fight, that's a 10. Like that's a trained person who's at the professional level already. And they can do anything they want pretty much to fuck you up. <laughs> like Try to take your head off. Yeah. yeah. And the, you may come out with a broken leg, a broken hand, a broken wrist, fucked up face, broken orbital jaw, like that you're not getting that from a jiu-jitsu competition and you can do that even from just punching somebody wrong like i kick you in the elbow i kick you in the hip bone snap your shin then bro i'm not gonna be able to walk yeah even if it's not as grisly as a shin snap Mm. if i throw like a 60 or 70 percent kick and i hit you in the elbow i might be able to poker face it but i'm not gonna be able to put much weight in that foot you know like all that you ever head kick somebody shit fucking hurts like if you land a solid if you land a solid head kick like my foot to your skull, I mean, of course, it's going to hurt you more, but it's not good. Like, your foot will balloon up like that. After my first MMA fight, I had a hematoma on my elbow that was, like, two inches big from elbowing yeah. someone else. Hit. It wasn't yeah. even me getting hit. And I, st- I was like, fuck, I couldn't, like, stretch my arm the next day. Elbowing somebody's hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm on the fence regarding this, but I would have to say, uh, shout out to my man, Ashvin. So, Ashvin's a dark horse of Singaporean MMA. You got to watch out for this guy. Uh, Is he one uh, of the highlight real guys? He is one of the impact guys. Oh, impact guys. So um, he used to be from this gym called Creation. I don't know if you know this gym. Mm. But I'll bring him here to train him. He's the best purple belt in Singapore. And uh, What's his name? Ashvin. Ashvin. Ashvin Singh. So dark horse of Singapore in MMA. He, he told me something that kind of makes a lot of sense. So like fighting is like deception, right? And you have to deceive not only your opponent, but yourself. It's, it's like from the art of war. So um, it's true that jiu-jitsu is not a fight. But you have to treat it like one if you want to win to reach to reach the highest oh, yeah. levels. Right? I agree with that. You got to be sure. like, this guy's going to fuck me up. Oh my God, I'm going to fight. I treat it like a fight, you know? So when I used to compete in jiu-jitsu, it's always a fight to me. You know, MMA, to some people it's a sport, but to me, I'm going into a fight. Like, I wake up in the morning, I take a shower. It's always like this for me. I'm like, on the day of the fight, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm not even, it's funny now when you say it, but I know I'm going to feel it on like March 7. I'm going to wake up, take a shower, and that, that 15 minutes of introspection is just going to, it shows you who you really are. I think that's what martial arts does. Yeah. It's that, oh my God, I can die, you know? Yeah. Start well, thinking about my family. Dude, <laughs> I, I have like, it's, it's gotten less severe, but I have borderline panic attacks before I fight every mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Like when I, my first amateur MMA fight, I felt like panic, like fight or flight. My first pro fight, I thought about jumping out the fucking window. Yeah. After I did it more and more, I didn't get the, like, I got to get the fuck out of here thing. But there was a little bit of it back there, right? Yes. Like, it gets pushed to the back as you get more and more exposure to it. But, man, the first, my first amateur MMA fight and my first professional MMA fight, I literally thought, like, I got to get the fuck out of here. Like, that panic. And then you, you get like, get your shit together, bitch. Yeah, you yeah, talk control. shit to yourself. You're like, I'm yeah. not a fucking punk ass. I'm, yeah. I'm fine. I'm, and you just, but those voices are yeah. very strong in your head. Yeah. And until you fought... I don't feel like that for a jiu-jitsu competition ever. I don't feel like I got to get the fuck out of here. Like, I felt like that for MMA. <laughs> like, yeah. Jiu-jitsu is less for sure. But yeah. MMA, wow. Even Mike Tyson felt that way. I think more fighters should uh, step up and talk about these kind of things. Because everybody, like, we have to play the game and be, like, tough and things like this, right? But everybody f- feels that fear, man. If you don't feel that fear, there's something wrong with you. So Tyson, I think it was in his, it was an amateur fight. It was for a title, and he was like, I'm going to get on the train and get the fuck out of here, man. It was Mike Tyson, like 70 yeah. years old. Yeah. and yeah, Isn't that crazy? That's yeah, so crazy. It's Tyson, dude. That's why it's one of those things that, like, to describe to somebody what fighting is like, you can't. It's one of those things that's it's so hyper surreal, mm-hmm. right? Like, I just remember when I was having my, those, those fights in particular, when they would happen, I, I just felt it was almost out of body. 
Like I, you get the tightness in the chest, you get the fear, the anxiety, and then, you know, the sort of bravery or courage or stubbornness or whatever your motivating thing is that actually makes you stay. And they're in battle constantly, right? The fear and anxiety yeah. of losing and then the not wanting to be a bitch and the courageousness of it's actually stepping the in bitch there. Voice. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. you have the bitch voice and then you have the the charismatic voice, right? Yeah. You have the bitch voice and then you have the, the hero voice. Yeah. The hero voice. Yeah. And they're just at constant odds. And you're like, right, right. it's quite hard to diso- like to differentiate the two. Cause you have elements of both inside you. You have the bitch and you have the hero and you have to reconcile the difference yeah, that's when you're about to fight, you know, a hundred percent. That's why martial arts. You got a new one there, by the way. I don't know if you oh, want it or not, oh. but thanks. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go I don't say no to beer. Mm. I think that's why martial arts help so much in your day to day life when you apply it correctly, because not only in fighting, even though it's very apparent in fighting about your bitch voice and your hero voice, but in day-to-day life, like um, going to work, you know, you didn't sleep properly, you wake up, oh man, oh fuck, you just call in sick, you know? But hey, it's it's up to you whether you want to follow the bitch voice or follow the hero voice, you know? And yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it permeates everything you do, the, the bitch and the hero voice. I mean, yeah, oh shit, you fucked it up, bro. I'll wipe it up. Oh right. my God, Wugong, make sure you use... Make sure you use that picture of him not knowing how to drink a <laughs> beer when we record it, uh, when you put it up on the internet. Uh, yeah, man, but I have that, like even, I mean, martial arts for sure, but getting any positive thing you want to do in your life. You want to okay. go to school. You want to hit the gym. You want to eat right. You want to, like, you know, you're arguing with your girlfriend or your wife and you want to say something to apologize, but you're like, fuck her, she, she did this <laughs> and this. And whatever, right? Like these narratives go through your head in every, and they permeate every aspect of your life. So if you if you find a hobby that, allows you to consistently overcome your inner bitch right. and your inner bitch voice, then that will translate into other aspects of your life. And yes. then that's why the martial arts community is so awesome. Yeah, it is. Because these are a group of people, the jiu-jitsu community in particular, but they're a group of people who, again, like I said earlier, in their spare time seek discomfort mm. for something that they're going to receive a long time in the future. Like, you know, if you want to get a black belt or you want to be a professional MMA fighter or even not, but if you want to, do any martial arts at a high level and you walk into a gym, it's going to be years of eating shit before you get to that point. Even when you're good, it's still going to eat shit. Yeah. (laughs) And even when you're good, like, I mean, let's say you train for six or eight years. Yeah. That's still on a long enough time frame. Not enough. You can be good, but there are people way better still. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and to improve, you got to seek out discomfort. So when I brought um, Robert Deagle in, he's one of John Danaher's guys. Uh, he's coming in for a seminar next week, I think. He, he hooked me like, I think it was six times in like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Every, like, oh, every 30, oh. 45 seconds. Yeah, it's unstoppable, man. I'm like, and I, I do leg locks. Like I defend leg locks decently well and it's just unstoppable. So even when you're good, to continually improve, you have to seek out the discomfort and humble yourself, you know? And even the, the best guys do it. So, yeah, I think that's that's generally true of life, you know. I, uh, but I don't know. It's quite different. So, I had the, we did this seminar. I guess we we just talk about this a little bit of the the seminar over the weekend. So I did the seminar with uh, Nick Gregoritis. He's he's Hodger Gracie's first black belt. He's yep. the he's the head of the Jiu Jitsu Brotherhood, which is our affiliation that we have. And man, he's a fucking interesting guy. How so? I, I'm just blown away by this guy. You know, it was really weird because. So I, I got my black belt over the weekend just for the... Congratulations. The, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Been a long road. Yeah. I think I said years. in the post, it was like 15 years. I yeah. mean, I started... I'm 31 now. I started jiu-jitsu when I was 16. So yeah, about How 15. crazy is it to look back? Yeah, well, I said this when I got the belt, right? It, it's weird because when you first start as a white belt, I mean, the concept of being a black belt was so foreign to me that my instructor was a, at that time a blue belt, but like a, six months later, he got his purple belt. So I'm seeing a, a high-level blue belt slash purple belt fuck everyone up. Yeah. And I mean, that's not even close to a black belt. So like when I started, the idea of getting a black belt was so insane. There wasn't even anybody in my state with a black belt. My state is like the size of Iran. It's the fucking size of a country. Right, and then there wasn't a single person in my state with a black belt when I started. Wow! And even the purple belts, you're like, holy shit, what is this sorcery? So then the idea of a black belt to me was just completely insane. But nonetheless, you think about it, right? You're like, oh, I, well, you imagine where you'll be, what you'll be doing if you stick to it, mm. what you're going to do when you get to that point. And for me, it was a bit difficult because I had to find a new instructor 14 years in. Right? I used to be GF team here. 
and then they had a falling out with with the old trifecta yeah, gym happens, and then i got caught in all of that and then basically i got told i couldn't be a part of gf team anymore so four stripe brown belt and then not being able to be part of the team that is a ronin yeah a wandering samurai yeah and then it was i was sort of bitter right mm -hmm. so i was bittersweet about the the whole about nick coming here and i kind of felt like a bit mick dojo -y, you know because i didn't really know the guy i've been training for so long but i got basically kicked out of my team 14 years in four stripe brown belt but it's my job and i need to get the black belt to continue mm -hmm. to pursue my career and all these kinds of things so i was really conflicted on the whole process and i also have kind of a shitty view about a lot of the black belts that i've been around you know that's why i made a joke earlier i'm like oh yeah you know I just got my black belt, so now I'm ready to start wearing all black gear and starting a cult, and I'm going to, you know, start asking people for shit. Like, I kind of joke about it, but I've seen black belts not behave in ways that I like a lot. It's like this whole Taiwan thing, right? But, uh, is it Taiwan? Taiwan. Uh, the, 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 the person who's, who's uh, texting this girl in Taiwan oh, yeah. and things like this, like that, right? Yeah, the guy we were talking about I think earlier. there's good and bad in everybody, and let's try to find a good in people. Um... And a lot of things, a lot of times I've, I've seen in martial arts is that there are some people who get so invested in the martial arts that they lose a bit of themselves along the way. And um, so so you, you can be a black belt, you can be like pro MMA fighter, super good, undefeated. But I think like true victory for me is just to be the best person that you can along with those um, external achievements. So yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my whole deal. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I've just seen a lot of negative be behaviors that I kind of associate with a black belt and it's not because of the belt it's not because it is because people are flawed but you know there's this mentor mentory thing mm -hmm. that happens with martial arts and yeah. it's it's very sacred and it, I think it's important but it's an aspect of the martial arts that I never really felt like mm -hmm. you know when I when I started my coach was a purple belt and then when I moved I kind of stopped training when I was in college and then I started Again, when I got back to Singapore and then I was at Evolve and I didn't really feel a connection with the instructors in that way. Like they, it was detached, right? Like the Evolve coaches were my coaches, but I didn't know them. I wasn't friends with them. Maybe like, that's where you're teaching now, man. That's your, that's your journey. So maybe you could give to somebody like what you never got yourself, you know? Yeah, so that's... a lot of white belts, blue belts training mm -hmm. here with you. Five years from now, maybe you're going to give them one like, like a black belt, you know? So you're full-time teaching now, right? Yeah. So it's going to be cool to to really make the journey a whole circle, be able to give that to somebody like what you've always wanted but couldn't get, you know? Yeah. Just be that mentor now to somebody. Yeah, that's what, well, that's why I think it's, it's important, right? Because with anything in life, anything that you learn, like your family, right? You mm -hmm. grow up with your family. You want to keep the things, the positive things that your family did and give those to your kids. But then the negative shit that you didn't like, you want to weed that out. Yeah, that's what right? makes the difference between a hero and a villain. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and and the whole thing was quite interesting to me, right? Because I mean, for so long I was with the GF team guys, and I mean, I lived with these are like five Brazilians, right? They were all black belts. I was like the younger, the youngest, pretty much of the group, and I was also the brown belt. And you know, it's tricky when you're all the same age because we were all the same age. So in some contexts, we're peers, but then on the mats, I'm I'm their student, right? But you know, we're all in like our mid twenties and shit. So it, I never really felt the mentor student relationship in that context and then i saw a lot of behaviors over the years not not the gf team people specifically but everywhere that i've been i've seen this behavior from black belts that i just it feels culty to me it feels shitty i've seen them manipulate people girls i've seen them bring down businesses a, a lot of times they're selfish and they ask for a lot and it, i think it's the power dynamics associated with the belt and i've also seen sort of cultish type tendencies to students in relationship to their black belt teachers and I, i've sort of observed this on the side and i missed a lot of the mentor student relationship but this guy nick that came from jiu-jitsu brotherhood man he just blew me away immediately talking to him he's extremely charismatic he's, he's hodger gracie's first black belt he's got like i think 13 or 14 academies throughout and, and we brought him here and i met him for the first time and dude the first thing he said to me when we sat down and you know i'm the four stripe brown belt coming to meet him he's trying to decide if i'm going to get the black belt and what the deal is and meet all the students and everything yeah and the first thing he says to me he looks at me and he goes dude just so you know the belts are bullshit oh shit that's, that's like the first thing that's the first thing he said to me when we sat down he goes okay. i know you're like you know 
you know, you're, you're trying to see what the deal with the Sorry, belt. Sorry, man. Hold that thought. Yeah, you're good. You got to pee? Yeah. Okay, let, let's pause it here because I, I got to pee and we'll, we'll get back to this as soon yeah, as we yeah, come belts back. Belts are bullshit right away. Okay, belts are bullshit. We'll get back, back to this when we come break. back. Okay, guys, Stronghold Podcast. We'll be back sh- uh, soon. Peace. Okay, everybody. We're back with hey, the Stronghold guys. Podcast and uh, we've all peed. Now I feel better. This is what happens if you drink. See, if I don't drink on the podcast, I don't have to go to the bathroom. But it's only with you degenerates that I have to fucking go all the time. Ah, it is what it is. True. So belts are bullshit. That's yeah, belts are bullshit. Yeah, man, this guy. Uh, so this Nick Gregoritis guy, he's the head of the Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood. He's a fascinating guy, man. Mm. You just talk to him, and in like 30 seconds, he's just extremely charismatic, right? Like, I picked him up at the airport, and he's one of those guys that, quite rare, that you talk to, and you actually feel like they listen to you. And he's not just waiting for his turn to speak. Right. He asks questions. He's immediately engaged in whatever you're doing. Mm. And like, this was actually one of the first guys that I actually felt like was mentoring me in a way. And I'm really not, I'm kind of cringy about the whole mentor thing, you know? And, but I really felt like that. And you know, what's even more interesting. So the first thing he told me was that the belts are bullshit. And then after that, he proceeded to talk to me about, he never spoke to me about training once. Like, he never talked to me about, like, this is how you do an arm bar. This is how you do this. The only thing he was explaining to me and teaching me was concepts that he's developed about how to retain students, about concepts that he's developed about how to interact with students. Like, he did this thing. And I, I noticed it the second he did it. So it was, like, the second or third day. We were about to go have, like, a two-hour-long lunch, and he was going to give me the rundown and coach me, right? He comes up to me, he grabs my hand, he goes, Luke, it's nice to see you. He shakes my hand like that, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he, he squeezes my arm. Like he's looking directly at me, he gives me a fucking squeeze, right? I noticed it when it happened. I, okay. I shook his hand, I was like, oh, that, you know, that felt kind of nice or whatever. He gave me a little shoulder squeeze. Felt good. And then we go to dinner like an hour and a half later and he goes, so this is one of the tips that I can give you for how to communicate, especially men. He goes, mm. when you introduce yourself, you talk to them, if they're coming in, they're regulars, if they're new people, you shake their hand, grab them on the shoulder you give them a squeeze you make eye contact with them and he's like and right away you'll get their attention and i was like this is fucking crazy he did that to me like an hour ago i registered that he did it in my brain that he didn't even know and then he's like this is a really useful strategy to get people's attention right off the bat something simple like make eye contact shake the person's hand and then physical you know some sort of physical contact i should meet the guy yeah really interesting and then he went on and on he goes the the belts are bullshit he's like let me give you an example. He goes, uh, you're, you're a four-stripe brown belt, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you've been a brown belt since 2015, 16, whatever year it was. And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, uh, so the, the idea of a black belt for you is completely irrelevant. And I was like, okay. And he goes, because if I give it to you tomorrow or today, or if I don't give it to you, you're going to have it in like a year or two. Another black belt decided that you're worth four stripes. Mm-hmm. So here I come three or four years later. Like, if another black belt vouched for you to four stripes, do you think two or three years later you're not going to be pretty close to the belt? He's like, you are, right? You're going to be close to that level. But let's say I do it today. Let's say I do it in a year. Ten years from now, you're still going to be running an academy. Is that right? And I'm like, well, if I'm lucky. And he goes, okay. So then the belts are fucking meaningless because for you, you are already been doing it for so long. What you're interested in is running your academy, keeping your students, and building your gym, right? And I'm like, yes. He's right. like, okay, then the ranks are fucking pointless for you. He's like, what you need to do is teach your classes well. You need to know how to interact with your students. You need to have systems in place for everything. Like when you get a message uh, from a student on the email, then you immediately text them. And then if it can ultimately lead to it, you do a voice call. And you have all of these strategies in place from a phone call, from an email, to when they walk in the door, to when you're rolling with them. And he just broke down the entire aspect of actually being a coach. And like a, a mentor to the students that walk into the gym. I never heard any of this from any of the Brazilian people I ever spoke to. All they ever said was like, this is how you do an arm bar. This is how you pass the guard. They never told me how to connect with people. They never told me how to run a gym. They never told me strategies to make sure that I retain students. They never told me how to like hit my, hit my margins. Like He was talking to me about more than jiu-jitsu, yeah. which was blew my fucking mind. All I'd ever been exposed to was like, this is how you do an armbar. This is how you pass the guard to this and do this and this and this. No like person had been like, bro, you're running an academy. That's your business. You need to do this right. And these are some steps that you can do from making eye contact to setting up strategies to call back students to making sure that you give people private attention in each class. And then he has all these other tricks that he does. Like um, after he does a technique, he always asks questions. 
because it reinforces the feedback loop so you mm -hmm. don't just sit there and talk right. nonstop. And then uh, so he asks questions and he does things at the end of every trading session. He goes, okay, everybody give me five details from the techniques that we learned today. And he goes around the group. So you have to actually memorize it. Right. And all these really interesting, he was teaching me how to be a teacher and a mentor. And I've never been approached in the context of my job in that way. And it was fucking fascinating, man. Mm. It was really interesting. A totally new way to look at this thing. Yeah, he's a good businessman, it sounds like. Yeah, I yeah. just, I was really stubborn and bitter. Like, I was like, okay, this dude's coming here. And I've got, it felt like a job interview almost, right? Like, okay. I, I kind of had that. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to meet this guy and it's going to be whatever. And I hope I got to roll with him and hopefully I don't fuck it up. And then he's got to meet my students and see my gym. And I hope I live up to the expectations. And, but I don't want to be a fucking douche. And, you know, it's just like all this stuff. And then he came and he totally disarmed me and only talked to me about, and he goes, um, he goes, you know, this is the people business. He's like, I can show you yes. blue belts and purple belts who have hundreds of students. And then I can show you world championship black belts who can't keep 50. And he's like, so this whole thing for you is bullshit. You need to wrap your head around teaching these people, being a mentor and creating the environment that people want to train in. Like the black belt is fucking stupid. And after the fact, I kind of realized like, man, this dude, he just fucking gets it, man. God, he's interesting. Really interesting guy. Yeah, cool guy. Is he coming down again? I don't know. You want to know something really interesting he did too. It'll be a while, I think, before he comes down. Because uh, he's only doing like one tour of Asia. He was... He's basically into, I think, the mentor. He's like, like a life coach. Right, right. And I, again, I was kind of cynical about this. I'm Is like, it an English guy? Uh, he's South African. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, you know, I was like being a bit bro-ish about it, I guess. I'm like, oh, life coach, whatever the fuck. Like, you know, whatever. I was kind of just passing it off. But then after meeting the guy, I'm just like, damn, man. Like, fuck is this guy charismatic? He's just... He, he's so approachable. One thing he did that was really interesting. First of all, he talked to everybody. He mm. memorized everybody's name. We had like 25 people he never met. And he would ask people their name, and then he would get it wrong, and he would go back to them over and over until he got it. He would always, if he forgot your name, he'd go back to you again until he remembered it. Yeah, he gets it. He's a good... Man, he gave everybody personal attention. And one thing he did... <laughs> the guy just fucking gets it. He went to, uh, so, you know, Sean, the other owner of the gym, the brown belt, yeah. you train with him, yeah, right? I trained with him. Fucking uh, beast. Yeah. I rode with him a couple of times. Fucking yeah. beast. Right. One yeah. of the best brown belts in Singapore for sure. Mm. And, uh, one of the owners of stronghold. So because I was a four stripe brown belt and he's also a brown belt, I didn't promote him ever because I got to keep the rules. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so he came and then Nick didn't have a chance to roll with Sean yet just because he'd only rolled the first day and we did the grading at the end of the second day before we rolled. And uh, so I gave Sean two stripes because I was like, okay, two stripes. He definitely deserves that. He's been a brown belt for like almost two years already. Right. So like I'll just give him two stripes. Nick was like, good. As I did, he's like, good. You know? And then after the seminar, we all roll. I look over and I see Sean rolling with Nick. And uh, they start rolling together, just kind of whatever. And then uh, I start rolling with somebody. And then at the end of the roll, Nick looks over to me. He goes, Luke, Luke, come here. And I was like, okay, cool. And he's like, I'm giving Sean an extra stripe right on the spot because you didn't tell me how good he was. So Nick rolled with this guy. I gave him two stripes just that day. Then Nick rolled with them. Had his mind like blown by how good Sean was. And he's like, I'm giving him another stripe right on the spot. So yeah. just in that day, he, Sean got three stripes. He got made every, twice. every person in the gym connected with this guy. He's very easy to talk to. He asks questions. He's not just waiting for you to talk. Really fucking fascinating guy. man. He made me rethink the sort of business that we're in. Because yeah. the skills are the, the preliminary thing. But that's only if you're thinking about it short term, getting people in the door. Mm. But keeping these people... And motivating them, man, he just gave me a totally different lens to view the whole thing through. You got to have good skills. That's that's what the sport is based upon. That's what you're selling, right? You're teaching that. Mm, yeah, uh, I'm getting to realize this as well. Um, after I started doing Singapore BJJ and started getting to all this kind of stuff, is that you have to be good with people, man. This is the people business, like what Nick said. So uh, when I used to compete, I was a younger guy. And I had this chip on my shoulder kind of thing going on. And I wouldn't talk as much to uh, people I didn't train with in the gym, right? It's not that like I was being a dick or anything. And I've observed this with a lot uh, in competitors and things like that. Just, like, it, it takes a bit of self-absorption to compete. You got to want to improve yourself. You got to want to win, right? So, But some of these white belts they are training with are like, like black belts at business or like black belts at investing. Or like they, they can teach you things as well. So... Um, I try to keep a white belt mentality now and like learn from everybody. But yeah, definitely Nick sounds like a very, very interesting guy. 
Yeah, I, I mean, wh- what's your opinion on mentors? Because, uh, you know, for me, I've had them throughout my life, but they've been very fleeting. And, I, I, you know, I come from an adopted family, so I didn't really have a mentor. Like, you know, I didn't grow up with a dad or anything right. like that. So I don't really have that thing. I guess I'm somewhat cynical toward it. But when I talked to this guy, I was like, man, he's one of the few people that I've talked to that I felt was listening to me and not just waiting for his turn to talk. And mm-hmm. that felt really valuable. So, I mean, what's your take on mentors and, and things like that? Do well, you have people that you go to for wisdom or do you kind of piece them together and then you create your collage of mentors and then draw from that what you will? Like, how do you do it? To answer your first question, I think mentors are life-changing. And because, shit, who's this quote by? It's, it's great. It's, you learn from, okay, if you're stupid, you don't learn from your mistakes. If you're a normal person you learn from your mistakes. But if you're a smart person, you learn from other people's mistakes. Mm, yeah, that's good so one. the reason why like your jiu-jitsu is at such a high level now is if you watch 20 years ago, if you watched like Hoyce Gracie, you could probably like do well against Hoyce Gracie, right? But we all, like as a human race, we're all learning from each other's, like our predecessors' mistakes and their, and their strengths and their triumphs. So we're all building on that. So if you get a mentor, you can distill a lot of that. You can skip all the hardship, all the years it requires for you to do an armbar properly and just have somebody tell you how to do it and how how they discovered that. So not just with jiu-jitsu techniques, but with things like life and business. Having a mentor is so, so important. Um, the whole reason why I managed to start uh, Singapore Jiu-Jitsu Open is because I met my partner. I wouldn't call him like... Uh, he's not my... I would call him a mentor in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important to have somebody you can look up to who's ahead of you and who holds you accountable to a lot of things because it's like that bitch voice, right? If nobody holds you accountable, then it's easier to fall by the wayside. And I like to give this example. Um, for example, if Tyson, I keep going back to Tyson, but if Tyson didn't have Kuz Diamato, he wouldn't be Tyson for yeah. sure. And his life started to go apart after the Amato died. Yeah. And they fired, um, shit, what was his name? The one guy that was close. Yeah, okay, to I can't Diamato, remember his right? name too, but I know you're talking about. Yeah, that white, that, that yeah. white guy. Yeah. So, yeah, if, so, the Amato managed to distill like 60 years of boxing knowledge into Tyson. And, yeah, if he hadn't adopted Tyson, Tyson would have just probably be dead by now, you know? And Tyson says so as well. And, I think mentors, if you're lucky enough to find them and have a connection with them, uh, it's it's worth more than gold, man. That's yeah, my th- opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, yeah, the, the tricky thing with mentors, at least in my experience, has been, you know, when you see them do things you wish you hadn't seen or uh, when, you know, the, the thing is you get a lot of exposure to, to people and when you're exposed to somebody long enough, you're going to see their lesser qualities, right. right? Right. And for me, it's sort of been differentiating between those two things. And, you know, when you see somebody do something shitty and then you also look up, look up to them, it it's quite different, right? But I think the interesting thing, too, with Nick is that Nick's quite older than me. You know, he's like 10-something 10, 10 years older than me. All the other people that I worked with were the same age. Yeah. So, you know, I would see them doing stuff that young people do. And then it's kind of hard to view them in that context. Even it's though easier when they're older. Yeah, right? even though that skill may be they're extremely impressive, right? I mean mm. there's no question that the people that I've trained with over the years are incredibly skilled at jiu-jitsu. Right? But when I spoke to him the things that he were t- was saying to me transcended jiu-jitsu. And he looked as at the skills almost as the... I mean I don't want it to come across negative or condescending or anything, but he looked at the actual skills themselves as almost trivial. Hmm. assuming that there's a baseline already, right? He, he told me, he's like, you're, you're four stripe brown belt. You've been four stripe brown belt for years. There, there's some black belts that are better than you. There's some that you're probably better than. Like you, you've done the time you've had the training, you own an Academy. Like the belt is what he said to me. The belt for you is the least significant thing. Like what you need to do is build your Academy and be that place. And it, it's really interesting, man, as, especially as I continue to go. And I think this could resonate for you too, but it's the, the leadership skills. Right, and connecting with the people and being able to lead them, and not let them see you. Like you have an off day, you come in, you feel shitty. Like you just can't, you can't do that, you know, because it will just leak into your life. And if you're a good leader and you build something properly, like over a long enough time, I think that stuff sticks around. Like if you if you open a company, you run a company, and you have good leadership skills, mm. like eventually that seems to me to be the thing that comes to the surface the most. And I get what why you're so 
cringe about like a mentor like the like words like mentor or like even leader. professor master that shit makes me fucking cringe dude it's maybe like, it's my americanness too my anti-authoritarian just american i don't psyche. think it's that but it's like it's <laughs> been so it's been so how do you say you, you you get like people in the industry who are not like up to par like calling themselves master or like leader like things like this but there are some real people out there man who, yeah. who are really like up to the up to the cut and if you find those people you get your well mind i mean if this, this ufc gym guy wants to be called master yeah. right i master never heard or? that from nick or from any of this is the thing right if you're a master if you're if you're someone of high esteem in your community, you don't need to call yourself that. Yeah. So if you're asking to be called master, you're probably a fucking asshole. And if people call you master and you don't ask for it, you're probably a master. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Game of Thrones, right? So Tyrion Lannister was like saying, if you need people to call you king, then you're not really king. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and it's like that. So if you're going online and you're asking people to call you professor and you're asking people to call you master, you're probably overcompensating for, right. for some other area in your life. But yeah, it was quite fascinating, man, because I guess, I guess Nick, for me, also served as a kind of business mentor in that, in that context, because mm. I, I've literally never spoken to anybody about business except for my partners, because okay. right? we're only focused on our business, but I've never really spoken to somebody face-to-face who's working on their business and what right. their, especially somebody in my field. He owns like 14, 14 academies across the world, and then he's into this life coaching thing. And yeah, man, just, just after talking to him, I was like, fuck, like, the guy's charismatic. I'm he's gonna so search him up. He, he, he sounds like a yeah, very, very really interesting guy. He was really, really surprising, man. It was really interesting to talk to him. I'm happy to be an affiliate of his and to any other uh, Jiu Jitsu Brotherhood people out there that are maybe listening. The guy was impressive, man. Mm, really, okay. really impressive. Had this shit together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was his. How do, you, how do you pronounce his entire name? Nick, Nick Nicholas Gregoritis. Gregoritis, okay. Yeah. Nicholas Gregoritis. Gonna search him up. Yeah, it's was, it was quite interesting, man. So, uh, yeah, let's go back to your. Uh, I want to go back to your shit a little bit, cause <laughs> sure, we glaze over in the middle, and maybe we'll finish up with this. I don't know how long. How are we doing on time? Move on. Hour and a half now. Okay, hour thirty now. So let, let's go back, cause I, w- <laughs> I want to finish up on this subject and then talk to you more broadly about it. So, I mean, this year, twenty twenty is gonna be a big one for you. Yeah, it's gonna be a crazy year, dude. You got a title fight coming up. You got. Uh, amateur MMA promotion and you got your jiu-jitsu promotion yeah I'm also uh, going to write like I actually and you're getting sued and I'm getting sued <laughs> yeah just broke up my girlfriend got diagnosed with ADHD oh, da, 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 da. Jesus Christ dude yeah, 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 yeah. you're having a year yeah T- 2020 you and most people has so far not gone well bro got fucking bushfires in it and yeah in Australia Donald Trump bombing people and shit 2020 oh, is off crazy. to a rough start dude yeah I don't know I- I'll make the best of it it's fine um I think I think the trick with it is I I accept failure. Like I look at what's the worst possible scenario and I accept it. So what happens if I lose a fight? Like I lose a fight, right? Like yeah, I, you've lost one go. before, right? Something the end of the world. What happens if I lose the lawsuit? Uh, I pay eighty thousand dollars around there, or I become bankrupt. Like that's okay. I'll, I'll bounce back in like five to seven years. Mm-hmm. So it, it it takes away a lot of anxiety if you if you think about things like that way. Like worst case scenario, like what what's the worst thing happen, right? So, yeah, I think, I think that's my thing. Well, it's important to know always if you're depressed, if life is difficult, if whatever, the, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. All right. You can be sued. You can, di- like, work can suck. Your, your wife or your kids are, blah, like, everything's okay. Just keep going. Nothing Press is, on. <laughs> Press on, right? Nothing's ever as good or as bad as your mind tells it, as your mind tells you. It just is, you know? So, Yeah. Uh, yeah, big year, man. Uh, trying to focus more. So, so my thing was, I think everybody is kind of looking at me as like the business kind of guy or like whatever. But I don't know, man. I never like Singapore Jiu Jitsu Open started on a whim, um, and I kept it going because of how incredible it was in in the sense that I could bond this entire community together. The kids competing now, getting a lot of good reviews. So I think I managed to fill in like this ecological niche where like they, they needed an IBGJF tournament in Singapore where people can could compete like without a lot of stress, right? So I think Singapore and Southeast Asian MMA needs an MMA promotion like this and I'm gonna do it. But in the end, like I'm not really like a business guy, man. I just wanna I just wanna write, kinda be like a bohemian writer, mm. wander the world a little bit. Uh yeah, so win the belt. So these two months, I'm just going to be focused on training and winning this belt. 
and we'll see what happens. Yeah, put the fighting first. That's yeah. for sure. Let yeah. everybody else handle, you know, do what you can in your spare time. But yeah, man, I mean, you could have a really, really good 2020 or a horrible, a fucking awful one. <laughs> ah, it's okay. <laughs> no, nah, just shit talking and you do. You know, it, it'll probably be like anything. You you get some W's and you get some L's and, yeah. you know, it, it'll probably life. be. Yes, exactly. But you're young and you got plenty of time to sort this out. Thanks, man. But uh, well, I think what's interesting about you is that you exactly what you said you're not afraid to fuck up or make a mistake and you're willing to put it out there because you know dude, there's a ton of people who's like oh we'll do a jiu-jitsu competition it'll be awesome or we'll do this or we'll write or we'll do a mma promotion or we'll talk shit about the ufc gym or whatever the fuck yeah right but you you do it and you're doing it your own way and you just got to stick down that path man that's that's the only way because for you you're like you don't see yourself as a businessman well you don't need to like you just do you do you yeah. And then all of the business stuff will line up and the relationships will line up. And if you're, you're pretty honest with yourself and you, you know, you stay objective and you don't turn into a fucking douche, like everything, <laughs> everything will, you gotta will check line me up. if I turn into a douche, man, well, just call me on Facebook. If you have good friends, then they'll, they'll check you and make sure you're not douching it yeah. up too bad. Thank you. Thank but you for the kind words. Uh, yeah. I think you gotta be honest with yourself. Yeah. And I don't know, man, I just think funnily enough, funnily enough, like, like, what am I doing? Like, this is already the punishment. Like, like 24 years old dropping out of uni like running random events like this is already the punishment like what can you do <laughs> yeah but you worse? but you already have seen the the benefits of it cuz you're 24 years old you're uh you're a blue belt you're starting up this writing career and you're starting this you're basically a combat sports organizer at this point and you know people would say well what's the point or What's uh, what made you want to do that? Okay, well, here's the thing. You did it, and then whether it's the lawsuit, whether it's the SGBJ Open, whether it's the Lion, Lion City fights, you have people immediately to support you because the community is so fucking awesome. Thank you kindly. That's the number one, man. This is yeah. what I keep telling people. Like, um, I, did, I did a post after I got my black belt, and it was uh, something to the effect of, I feel privileged and honored to be a part of the global yeah, martial right, arts man. community because it is the best fucking community in the world. I got after I got my black belt. I mean, you know, people when you meet them, the you know, over a long time as you become friends with more and more people, some close knit relationships tend to fade. Right. Right. But the thing that's so good about the martial arts community in particular is that those bonds are so tight. When mm. you train with those people, when you when you punch and kick and choke each other and you suffer, it's like being in the army. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like that, it's that shared yeah. trauma that unites you with a group of people in a way that's unique to anything else. When you go out to compete, when you fly overseas to fight. You yeah. Know, when different. you train with people who are punching and kicking you and choking you and going through that struggle together, mm. th that's what creates real bonds. And it, it's like that with the military and it's like that with, with several other things. But to me, it's that mental and physical stress and fatigue that you go through with your comrades that creates these really really tight bonds that you just don't see in other communities it and is. as you can tell it you're i mean it doesn't matter if it's black belts if it's this if it's the uh, own owners if it's who like people will support you because you you're, you're in that community that shares in the suffering which yeah. is why the ufc gym acting like they're doing acting like they are within a community of like-minded people is so shitty uh, yeah, we speak the same language. We train yes. the same sport. Um, I think they're being a bit arrogant, to be honest. So we will see. Hopefully, I win. And so, what's the goal? Is it like to get them to settle? Is it to no? The goal is to win this lawsuit. Mm. Um, they've already tried. I mean, not they, but like we've already tried to settle, like with all defamation suits. But it, it's just not gonna work out. So uh, my f my lawyer is gonna court on February s February nineteen. Uh, there's a mediation going on, but we're not gonna settle. I don't think so. The goal is to win this lawsuit, win the title belt, and just win at everything. I just wonder how these fucking, how this is going to be litigated. It's such a... And Singapore defamation laws are a bit are like different than in the oh, US. Oh, yeah, right? for sure. So, I mean, they're yeah, serious about They definitely this shit, yeah. do have a case. Yeah. It's how you approach it and how you fight it. So Yeah. Finish it up soon. Yeah, man. I, I mean, I I agree with you. The you're gonna have an interesting year. You got a two. You got a tournament. You got an amateur. Well, you got a title fight, and then you got a amateur MMA promotion. A new one. Yes. By the way, people sign up for that shit. Yeah. Uh. So if give us the details on that. I want to get into the MMA promotion a little bit before we finish. Okay. So to wrap this up, uh, if you're a fighter, 
uh, we're looking for amateur fighters, especially MMA fighters in Singapore. I know there are tons of guys. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, just Southeast Asia in general, Asia, if you want to fly down. We're running a tournament. We're planning to do two events this year and we are creating title belts. It's going to be, it's not going to be going to be a league, but it's going to be a, a good show, you know. So like walkout songs, everything. Uh, six ounce gloves, shin pads. Uh, it's going to be in the ring initially, but hopefully we'll get funding and move it into a cage. So it's going to be, it's going to be good. So we're going to release more details soon. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Lion City Championship. Um, yeah, Lion City Championship, Instagram and Facebook. We're going to release more details soon. We're going to ask for fighters. Our first event is going to be late April or early May. Yeah. And then uh, what about the SGBG Open stuff? Uh, Singapore Jiu Jitsu Open. We're going to have a fifth event on March 7 and 8. It's going to be Gi No Gi Kits, everything. Uh, Gi No Gi Kits, Masters. And yeah, so come over, guys. It's going to be a good event, chill event. Just roll uh, So. Yeah, and then your fight, bro, bro you got so much Boom. shit going yeah, on. Yeah, 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 a lot of shit going on. Jesus Christ, if you uh, make it to the end of 2020, it's going to be a miracle. My fight, <laughs> uh, March 7, so I'm not going to be there at Singapore BGJ Open. Uh, a lot of good guys going to be handling it for me. So I'm going to be fighting for the Octagon Asia flyweight belt uh, against an undefeated opponent, a hometown guy. So I plan to win. Um, so tune in. I'm probably going to be sh- uh, streaming the fight live. So if you want to watch the fight live, Follow me on Instagram, uh, Elvin Ang125, Facebook, yeah, it's all there. So uh, I'm actually going to be filming um, like my training leading up to a fight, like professional um, filming, like, like a UFC embedded kind of thing. So stay tuned. So it's, it's going to be good. I'm going to be having a crazy like first quarter of 2020. Hopefully you can go on a break after that. Yeah, dude, you'll deserve it. Yeah. And then last but not least, most importantly, perhaps the, the GoFundMe information. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I really give have us, a lot give, of things going on. Uh, By the way, just, I mean, take as much time as you need to get this story out and say anything else that you feel like you need to say because this is important. And I really want the, the community in Singapore and abroad to make sure that they look up for themselves, right? Look up for themselves. Just if you're an experienced uh, jiu-jitsu player or martial artist, just go look at this information, share the information. Anybody with eyes can look and see that you should not be sharing or, or rather taking all of the brunt of this lawsuit and right. it is a slap lawsuit and it's and it's bullshit so just give them any information that you you feel like you thanks luke do. so uh for those of you who don't know i'm getting sued and i'm i'm really so touched i want to say it again that there's a hundred backers for me that are friends who i know that privately um transfer me money to pay now so i've raised over four thousand dollars i think about four point three or four point four thousand dollars over a hundred backers so uh if you want me to if you want to support me to win this lawsuit, it really, really means a lot. Uh, this money will go to paying for my lawyers, who are very good lawyers, and we are trying to win this case. Um, I think we have a good, good chance, and I won't be... Even if I don't manage to raise the full sum, I'm going to back borrow and steal, like I said. I'm not going to be bullied into submission. I'm telling the truth. So, yeah, I'm just... Uh, do you have the actual address and uh, where yes, they can find so you? Yes, you so you can find you can find the link to the go get funding on Elvin Ang one twenty five, and it's also on my social media. I post about it every day because I'm so annoyed, and people are reposting. Um, McDojo Life has picked it up. I think a couple more, um, more, yeah, yeah. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be blowing up, guys. So follow me on social media if you want to get um, in tune with this thing. So yeah, if you donate. It would be amazing, and every little bit counts. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then just just to wrap up, I'm going to say, please, guys, uh, share this section of the video. I'll try to link. I don't know what I can link in the bottom of the show uh, in the description, but any of the sort of public... Um, you, you've linked some on your Instagram yeah. and your social it's media. It's all over well. my social media. Yeah, but, but check Alvin's information, and then I'm going to type the URLs and stuff of the Reddit links and uh, the McDojo links and all that kind of stuff. I'll put it in the description so that you guys can read for yourself. But I, I really encourage all of you guys to try to do this. This is tricky. It's a tricky situation because th- it's very hard for any lawyer to look at this case with objectivity. Yeah, it's an interest- interesting case. It's extremely unusual, yeah. right? And when it comes to something like the martial arts community, it's totally subjective. And if somebody looks at it on paper without the public opinion differing from what they're looking at, it's going to be tough to win. So I encourage everybody here, if you're part of the community, to to look at the information, reach out, and support Alvin because 
I really believe that this will be a case of public opinion. And if collectively we can all look at this and decide, with no disrespect to the guy, with no disrespect to any of this shit, but collectively we as a community decided that this person does not fit the qualifications required for his post. And furthermore, that Alvin should not be fucking sued over giving his opinion and the criticism of an employee. If the entire community came out against an employee that I had at the gym, I would consider my hire. I would not sue somebody. And with all the things that we talked about earlier with people, you know, people feeling like they can't speak out because of people like Josh and people like the person we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. And then this UFC defamation slap lawsuits that they're doing on you. If we can't speak out and we can't be honest in our criticisms of things within our community, then, then what are we doing? It's the nature of our business. Yeah. All that requires for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't want to label anybody as evil, but the point is stands still, right? The point still remains that it, if you should be able to criticize somebody objectively without fear of being fucking sued. Yes, and I think, yeah, that's the basis of it all, right? So, yeah, I really think, like, the right to criticize or the freedom to do it is a huge thing, like more than more than what people are picking up on. So, yeah. All right, Alvin. Thank Had you, a pleasure, man. dude. Thank you so much. Second it's podcast. Good. You're good. only the second person that I've done two podcasts with. Uh, who's the first? Uh, my buddy Greg. He's the guy that did the first yeah, episode. Yeah, 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 I watched that. I did two with him. So, uh, all right, thank man. Thank you for having well, me, man. Thank you for coming on, man. I, I appreciate this. Thank you. I, I hope you guys all enjoyed the, the conversation. I'll post some show notes uh, at the end where you guys can all follow the Alvin story, and I'll post the link to your GoFundMe page. Thank you kindly, man. And then, uh, you know, we'll have you back on whenever you have more information. Thank you, dude. Please. Hopefully, I'll be having some new hardware. I'll be having a belt. Yeah, a new belt and some new stories. Bro, these fucking nerds love this shit. Like, oh, I love it. I'm a nerd. Man, Ooh. seriously, like a legal uh, jujitsu case that gets taken to court. Yeah. Unfortunately, you're the person who has to deal with it. But, bro, this is like law and order for jiu-jitsu nerds, which is why it blows up on Reddit and blows up in all these places. Because yeah, it's been quite crazy. It's such a niche thing. And to, to think about the fact that people are going to go to court over the nuance of what constitutes a jiu-jitsu rank and then whether people are qualified to teach martial arts. I mean, this is That's interesting, huh? truly fascinating, man. It's really interesting. I think in the next two decades, it's going to, like, martial is going to blow up especially here in singapore so yeah and you're also tra blazing the trail for this in this country uh which is quite interesting too because i mean think about it right if you had a if you had a degree from a university mm -hmm. I, this is the only way i can think about it right if you had a university degree and it turned out that that university is there but you find out that it's pretty shit yeah but it is a real university degree what do you do do you hire the person because their credentials technically are there, but there's so many other people that you should hire over that person. What, we really get into the weeds here, man. It's That's what I... Uh, so I had to explain this to my lawyers, right? So this is what I told them. Like, imagine if I had a law degree from a degree, like, like a degree mill. Am I really a lawyer? Though? Can I practice law? Like, would you trust me to practice law? Like, you won't, right? So that's actually what is happening here right now. So... Yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah, and then they have to get a field of non-experts mm. in the field to decide what is legitimate and what's not. That's why it's so important that the community collectively come together because when there's enough collective agreement, when the martial arts community in Singapore comes out and voices their opinion and it's overwhelming, then lawyers cannot deny that, right? They cannot deny the voice of hundreds of professional martial artists or highly trained martial artists. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an irrefutable fact. This guy doesn't have anything similar to brown belt level, not even close. It's not like he's like a blue belt or it's just like untrained, you know? So he shouldn't be teaching people at all, especially being close to kids, especially being close to women, just teaching them everything like from knife skills to ground skills to wrestling. It's just not right. And I stand by what I said. And now I'm getting punished for it, but we will see what happens. Yeah, and I feel like the narrative has flipped because not only... I, I don't want to put so much emphasis on the guy itself. Right. Right? And the reason I want to do that is because it's so shitty of the UFC gym to sue you for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, I don't even think that the, the guy himself 
he's just sucked into this thing, I think, too. Yeah, I think he's, he's just got, scared. Yeah, he's, he's just, just like, gotten wow. sucked into this vortex, and he's just like, oh, my God, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And he's, he's a fucking... Just by the wayside, right? He's just got... He's had his part to play, though. He can't play the victim. Yeah, he played his part, but then... He was warm. The fact that the UFC gym decides to go after someone within the community to do this, even though the community itself is coming out in your favor, is what really disappoints me. The arrogant man. I mean, okay, this yeah. is what happens if you get... Uh, I don't want to say anything that'll get me in trouble, but in all aspects of martial arts... From boxing to jiu-jitsu to MMA, you can't have somebody who is untrained leading the charge, you know? It's like... And then that's also immune to criticism. Yeah. Because not only is he untrained, all this, all this, but then when criticism comes, the parent company's like, no, you're sued. It's like, wait, you weren't the one that started this. So the community decides to criticize this guy and criticize this guy and criticize this guy. And then you decide to criticize this guy. It goes viral. And then all of a sudden, the UFC gym is like, no, you cannot criticize this guy Fuck you, here's a lawsuit. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, just trying to keep me quiet. Yeah, I mean, oh, Jesus, man, I can't believe, I can't even believe we're in this state. I mean, they can just disagree with you and not sue you. Here's they can be like, well, we like him, so we're going to keep him. Okay, cool. Even, yeah. if, even if everybody agrees, oh, he's not a brown belt, we don't care, we like him. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Then fine. Why do they sue high. you? Man, if I would have done so many things differently, I, I just think it's a bit crazy. And then they're shitty with you on Facebook. What did they say? They're like, lol. <laughs> what did, yeah, they lol. They yeah. lol. I heard that guy got fired. Though. Good. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Yeah. And then they also said, oh, we, we hope you enjoy this. Whatever. We'll see you in court. I, or we're going to see us. Whatever the fucking shitty thing they said. You can see it in the comments. Like, yeah. dude, for a parent company it's on not social right media to, to be like that, yeah. to be so petty. It's so weird, huh? Things are getting weird in Singapore in 2020, people. It's not Singapore, dude. It's all over the world. Everything is going crazy, man. Yeah, you can't, can't watch the news too much nowadays, man. Yeah, it's just 2020 is weird. <laughs> we're, we're up to a weird start here, man. All right, anyway, dude, I appreciate you coming here. Everybody, this is the Stronghold Podcast. Please like, share, subscribe. Any outlets, Bullshito, McDojo Life, any other of those, Everywhere. those awesome, really extremely important outlets Pillars of the community. That, yes, that vouch for people. They vouch for r ranks. They keep the integrity of the community intact. Please like, share, and uh, comment on this story. Get it out there. Alvin, you're going to have a crazy year, my dude. Thank you, brother. Come Thank you. Come back anytime. Thank you, man. Hopefully, when I come back, I'll have a new belt. Yes, absolutely. And we'll, you can wear it on the podcast. It's going to be a real belt. Wear it on the podcast. Like, no shirt. Yeah, I will. I will. No shirt. Just don't get too fat. <laughs> wear it. Come in here with your, with your little six-pack and the belt on, dude. Yeah, man. You know it's going to be good. And hopefully yeah. some good legal news. Hopefully. Thank All you, right. Kindy, man. Thank you. All right, everybody. Stronghold Podcast. I think this is episode 14, right? All right, everybody. We're out. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.